to get rid of totally the antitrust exemption for these insurance carriers. Let's allow them to compete head to head. If what? they're selling a standard plan and showing you the prices, then you've got real competition. What's interesting is Dr. I've Rowe. had no small business come to that conclusion. They came to the conclusion, let me get all of my health care on a pre-tax basis well, I'm, and, yeah. and allow me to be, instead of the small plans, into a larger plan like uh, roofers, like you know uh, construction, and be in larger pools. They've never said to me, you know, the, the reverse of that, that we well, watch what, have to do something. They wanted the cheaper plan. Take a look at what would happen. In my uh, region of Green Bay, a large employer in Green Bay sent me an email, and it said, don't give up the public option. I just got a quote from Blue Cross that's going up 29.3%. Yeah. I need some way to keep them honest on a level competing playing field. But I would say with transparency... If Blue Cross gives a large employer a significant discount, yeah. then the single mom and the small business mom and pop shop will say, well, that ought to be my price too. Well, I, I, I would hope that every member of this body who voted for it, those who vote against it could say it, but voted to increase those costs too and put a significant uh, cost factor on that, the rising of, of the cost, which is... Uh, so we need to take responsibility for what we this do. Dr. Good old Rowe, American Dr. Rowe, economic 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 Just one brief comment. And the, the problem, and I agree with everything you said about transparency, the problem with it is Medicare and Medicaid fix the prices. And when the prices are fixed lower than the costs, it's very difficult to have a competitive environment. And that's the problem when you get a urologist or a family practitioner or someone who has a disproportionate share of our Medicare patients who, who desperately need to be seen those costs, those prices that are fixed, they're not, they're not in a competitive market. And so the, co the, uh, the, the free market system can't work there. That's the problem with, with, with what he was saying. All right. I yield back my time. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. And uh, I thank you all, gentlemen. You know, I'm here long enough to see more physicians come here, and it's helpful. However, I do feel that you all are running us lawyers or, or raise for our money about being able to talk. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you all. The next, the next panel, uh, Ms. Jackson Lee, uh, Ms. Dahlkamper, Ms. Emerson, uh, Mr. Fleming, and Mr. Klein. Uh, well, Mr. Klein, then we'll call you up, Ms. Dahlkamper. And Ms. Yeah, okay, you want to come with the rest of the panel. Okay, uh, Ms. Jackson Lee and Mr. Klein. Mr. Scalise, are you with this crowd? Come on. Um, Ms. Jackson Lee. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, again, uh, many members have said that, but we do thank the Rules Committee for its indulgence. And I might add, I am also here supporting what I hope you'll get a chance to mark up, which is HR. Uh, 3961, the Medicare Physician Payment Reform Act of 2009. Uh, I support the underlying premise of this legislation, which is universal access uh, to all Americans uh, for health care, uh, and primarily note uh, some very important changes dealing with no pre-existing disease will deny you the right to insurance. Uh, lowering premiums for all Americans, and certainly uh, the public option. The first premise that I mentioned is the basis of my amendments, which are amendments two and three, which have to do with physician-owned hospitals. I'd like to utilize the terminology physician-aligned hospitals. And I just uh, shared generically with my colleagues uh, pictures of current physician-owned hospitals that have state-of-the-art equipment, that have emergency rooms, uh, and are serving uh, communities, both rural and urban, and frankly, uh, provide a great deal of service. In my own state, uh, for example, physician-owned hospitals employ 20,525 people in the state. Uh, the hospital projects under development in the state would employ another 13,250. Uh, those jobs, obviously, <clears throat> as the amendment is presently constructed, uh, the legislation presently constructed, would probably be interfered with. 
Nationally, there are more than 65,000 people employed at physician-owned hospitals, and if the new 124 new projects are completed, another 25,000 jobs will be created. Again, jobs don't equal <clears throat> access to health care, but it is certainly, I think, a very important aspect of it. So I'm offering uh, two amendments uh, that I would hope uh, that would be considered as we move forward. Let me thank the leadership that has worked on these issues and I believe understand these issues uh, very well. My first amendment has to do with extending the time for a Medicare certificate uh, to January 1st, uh, 2011. I'm very pleased to have received a letter of support from Congressman uh, Kevin Brady. Uh, there is a statement made by Congressman Sam Johnson on this very issue. And other members that are supporting this issue are Eddie Bernice Johnson, Ruben Hinojosa, um, <clears throat> Dan Boren, uh, Nick Rahal, uh, Parker Griffith, as well as Charlie Gonzalez, Vic Snyder, Lucia Rawl Allard, um, Henry Cuellar, Solomon Ortiz, Emmanuel Cleaver, uh, and Al Green. But the real uh, crux of the issue, Mr. Chairman, is that there are numbers of physician-owned hospitals almost in every district around the country. And I would like to offer into the record um, a packet that shows the number of physician-owned hospitals in states. I think even uh, one of the members of the Rules Committee, uh, yeah, Mr. Perlmutter, has a physician-owned hospital that this amendment would uh, offer. And I'd ask uh, unanimous consent to submit into the record uh, a chart that shows how many physician-owned hospitals around the nation, starting with Alabama. Without objection. Thank you so very much. Uh, so the amendment uh, would, in essence, uh, provide the opportunity for a criteria to be set in place so that hospitals under development, hospitals that um, are in the process of expansion, would have the opportunity to survive. There is architectural plans, funding or loan commitment, any local zoning requirements for the hospital would be met, uh, and as well, um, the uh, criteria would establish uh, the appropriate approach, and it is the same criteria that was used by CMS in 2003. This would help save a number of hospitals from almost California uh, to uh, the East Coast. Uh, some of those that are currently in that status are California, Oklahoma, uh, Colorado, uh, Texas, uh, and uh, a number of other states. The examples of the kinds of hospitals that we're speaking of are the very ones that I showed uh, the pictures of, hospitals that in fact are serving people around the nation. Let me also suggest to you that uh, in particular, uh, one hospital that meets this criteria is a hospital that was 123 years old uh, in Houston, uh, formerly run by the Sisters of Charity, and if the physicians who invested in this hospital had not uh, invested and kept it open, uh, this hospital would close. And it is a hospital that is serving the inner city. Uh, I also want to support an amendment by uh, Mr. Hinojosa dealing with DISH, uh, and it refers uh, to his community in the Valley, uh, and his community has 46.4% of residents with no health care insurance, uh, which also has a physician-owned hospital and is serving that very population. Uh, I have a second amendment that deals with uh, addressing the question of a physician-aligned hospital going forward that deals with the definition of a general acute care, which allows or takes into consideration the amount of Medicaid uh, that the hospital is um, treating or Medicaid patients. Uh, and uh, this amendment provides for protection of the closing of general acute hospitals uh, that are uh, subject to that provision, 1156, in the underlying bill. Uh, this amendment, uh, as I said, defines general acute care hospitals. It does so by requiring that a general acute care hospital delivers services in at least a majority of the major diagnostic codes administered by Medicare and Medicaid. The amendment also recognizes that uh, the uh, disproportionate share uh, of the hospitals is at a certain number. Further, the amendment would prohibit any discrimination against Medicare or Medicaid patients, 
requires a bona fide emergency room that is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and whose patients visit, visits exceed the state average of patient admissions through the emergency uh, department. St. Joseph Hospital, as an example of why this amendment is needed, is only symbolic of the numbers of hospitals that are listed on this sheet. St. Joseph's, for example, is the only community hospital in the geographical area without physician funding. The hospital would have closed its doors and downtown Houston would be without 800 beds and an emergency room. Let me be clear about that. Without the physician funding, that hospital would <coughs> be closed. St. Joseph provides care under more than half of the Medicare diagnostic codes that I've already said. St. Joseph is a full service hospital with an emergency room on site and 24 hour physician presence. According to a 2005 CMS study, physician owned hospitals perform better than community hospitals in areas such as quality, staff, specialization, clinical staff per patient, and complication rates. One statement uh, as I close, these hospitals are plentiful. I don't want to necessarily focus on Texas hospitals, but I think they provide, they provide examples for us. Uh, Baylor Hospital in, in Dallas, uh, the Baylor facility in Dallas is also under development in terms of a new project. St. Luke's Hospital in Houston has five new facilities under development. The nonprofit religious mission has the controlling interest, and they've already invested a number of millions of dollars for this project. One full service hospital has one phase already operating, but would be under the growth restrictions. The hospital cannot be completed if the new restrictions apply. The deadline is too strict. Uh, and these physician owned hospitals are only, this structure is only utilized so that there is money to expand and so that there is money, money for, in one instance, to keep these hospitals open. Uh, I'd ask my uh, members of the Rules Committee, my fellow colleagues, uh, to consider the underlying premise of this legislation, it's universal access to health care. Uh, with the limitations in the bill, um, I believe that hospitals would close, there would be fewer beds, and fewer opportunities to do what all of us would like to do, is to ensure that all America has uh, access to good quality health care and ask my colleagues to support amendments two and three of Jackson Lee Amendment to the underlying legislation. Mr. Scalise. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I know it's been a long night for everyone. I appreciate you allowing me to bring uh, three amendments that I have, if I can just go mm -hmm. through the three of them. The first is uh, titled Scalise-04, and this amendment requires that a certification be made to, uh, in essence, hold up the president's pledge that no American citizen would have a tax increase if they make less than $250,000 a year. The president said on numerous occasions uh, that no American would have their taxes raised if they made less than $250,000, and I think his quote was, not a dime. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office, I think in a few sections of this bill, specifically the 2.5% payroll tax on uninsured Americans, they estimate that provision alone uh, would add about an extra $20 billion in new taxes, most of which would fall on the backs of people who make less than $50,000 a year. Uh, so this amendment would ensure that the, uh, there had to be a certification to maintain the President's pledge that this bill would not raise taxes on any American citizen making less than $250,000 a year. The next amendment is Scalise-002, and this is a sunset amendment. Uh, just like we do with uh, many other things, there are a lot of tax cuts that have sunsets. There are a lot of federal agencies that have sunsets. Uh, this would put a four-year sunset date on this bill, and uh, clearly with a 1,990-page bill uh, that's completely rewriting about 17 percent of the country's economy, I think it's very important that we have that check and balance, that accountability, that if this were to pass into law, that this, these components of this legislation would have to come back to Congress for a review and sunset. And clearly, uh, if it's doing the things that the people that are bringing it purport, uh, then there wouldn't be any problem with that. But uh, if those of us who have serious concerns with many portions of this bill are correct, uh, then at least it would give us an opportunity uh, to yeah. unravel the mess that would be created in our health care system. So I think it's only appropriate that we put a four-year sunset in this bill to give Congress an opportunity to come back and actually review and make sure that it's not doing the damage that those of us that have suggested it would do. 
the final amendment is. Uh, that amendment is, I don't think there is an amendment in that bill. That bill doesn't raise taxes, it doesn't cut Medicare, and it doesn't include a government-run component. So clearly the government-run component with the taxes and the mandates and the cuts to Medicare are what we're concerned about, and, and that's what we've suggested the damage would be. And clearly if you would support our amendment, uh, I'm, I'm sure we would be open to a sunset to get your support. Uh, but then the final amendment is a local issue. This is uh, something that just recently came to, uh, to our attention. It's Scalise-003. This involves the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, they just recently announced that they will put a, a ban on raw oysters that are uh, harvested. On what? I'm sorry. On a, raw oysters? On raw oysters. Okay. It's a, it's a very big issue all along the Gulf Coast. I know uh, not only in Louisiana, but uh, Mississippi, Texas, Florida. Uh, a lot of our oyster fishermen are very up in arms by this uh, decision by the FDA or this threat by the FDA to come out with rules uh, that by 2011, all oysters harvested, harvested between the months of April and October would have to go through a pasteurization process. Now, coming from Louisiana, we're home to some of the best restaurants in the world. And I think it's ludicrous that some federal bureaucrat in Washington thinks they know better how to prepare oysters than one of our great New Orleans chefs. And in fact, the Louisiana Restaurant Association is very up in arms and strongly opposed to FDA doing this. This amendment would just require that if, uh, if they did go forward with any kind of attempt to make a rule, they would actually have to come to Congress and go through the major rulemaking process. So it would give us the accountability to be able to stop that from happening if, in fact, we determined, which we do suggest, that it would be not only detrimental to our oyster fishermen and our restaurants, but also to the millions of Americans who enjoy the fresh oysters that are harvested from the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so that's what that amendment does. Mm -hmm. And uh, with that, I do also support the pitts Stew Pack mm -hmm. amendment that would ban abortion that we tried in, in the Energy and Commerce Committee. I appreciate that you all are going to be taking that up to the Fleming Amendment, and I appreciate also that you, uh, Madam Chair, and the committee have already agreed to include the Republican alternative as an amendment that will be guaranteed a vote on the floor. Mm -hmm. I just hope these others are also afforded that same opportunity, and I'd uh, be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Scalise. Mr. Kirk? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I'm here on behalf of two amendments. Uh, <clears throat> when we look at Great Britain and Canada and show us uh, a historic trend of governments to underinvest in health care, uh, we now see comprehensively that uh, more Americans are satisfied with their health insurance uh, on a percentage basis than Canadians. We also see in Britain, government hospitals maintain nine intensive care unit beds per 100,000 Britons. Whereas in America, we have three times that number at 31 intensive care beds per 100,000. Britain has so underinvested in her health care system now. Uh, well into 60 years of government control, that Britain has fallen to less than two doctors per thousand people. That now ranks it next to Mexico and Turkey in the number of doctors per capita. My amendment is an important step to protect uh, the doctor-patient relationship and the integrity of the medical profession and the right of Americans to choose the care they deem appropriate without federal delay or restriction. It's founded on this premise that Congress should make no law that blocks the decision of American patients made with their doctor. If patients are our prime focus, and in the President's speeches, it's one of his first or second paragraphs, their rights should be protected in this law. Now, if that principle sounds familiar, for those of you who are expert in Medicare, it is. It is one of the first paragraphs of Title 18, the amendments to the Social Security Act that created Medicare which promised no interference or direction by the government in the practice of medicine. But that critical early component of Medicare has now been amended out of existence for many years. My amendment would reinstate the original Medicare promise. It prohibits the federal government from regulating privately supported medicine, legally protecting the doctor-patient relationship against federal controls or rationing of care not paid for by the government. It protects the rights of patients to obtain medical care services themselves, regardless of any federal program that might apply. For example, Canadian patients are prohibited from paying for their own health care, even if the government system denies or delays care treatment to 
keep the patient alive. It enables the Congress, under this amendment, to protect the right of each American to obtain their own health care, free of government interference, and protects the rights of patients to buy health insurance or to make any other arrangement to pay for their own health care, and guarantees American access to care under a federal health care program, such as Medicare or Medicaid, even if a patient obtained their own health care outside the program. For example, in the United Kingdom, cancer patients who are denied cancer drugs by the National Health Service and bought the drugs themselves were later denied care under this so-called uh, universal system because they bought and paid for cancer drugs themselves. And even in the U.S. system, if a Medicare patient pays a doctor for a service that would otherwise be covered by Medicare, the doctor is then suspended from Medicare for two years. This substantially restricts the ability of Medicare patients to pay for their own care if Medicare decides they are ineligible for a particular service normally covered. A doctor who provides a single service to a single Medicare patient outside the scope of the Medicare program, even without asking Medicare to pay, gives up the right to get paid for any Medicare service, for any Medicare patient, for two years. There are few doctors that are willing to make and suffer that penalty so substantially and indirectly. The rights of seniors and disabled patients covered as denied access to the health care of their choice, even if they decide to pay. This amendment repeals this two-year-old Medicare kickout for doctors to ensure that doctors can offer patients the best treatment possible and continue to practice under Medicare. If we do not adopt this amendment, Americans will be at risk when the government denies care, as is routinely done now in Canada and Great Britain. And once denied government care, many Canadians find doctors in the U.S. If the Congress orders the government to take over America's health care, the question will be this, where do we drive and where do we go? I think we need to promote a patient-centered care reform, and the Medical Rights Act under this First Amendment would do that. It is patterned after the first paragraph of the Medicare statute. The Second Amendment uh, would deal with a pricing problem, uh, very obvious under this bill. The amendment ensures that anyone purchasing insurance coverage after January 1, 2013 is exempt from the individual mandate if a less expensive insurance plan than those available under the bill was available six months prior to the implementation of the act. Here's the problem. Many young adults from Illinois and elsewhere between ages of 20 and 30 will be hit very hard by this legislation if they do not have coverage provided by their employers. The reason is that this bill requires that insurers may not charge 64-year-olds more than twice what they charge a healthy 19-year-old. Because of this, this rule, uh, premiums must be raised on the young tremendously. The bill will then provide an offset in the form of so-called premium credits based on their income to reach the so-called affordable premium definition for an individual. When you take everything in this legislation into account, young, healthy singles who lack coverage Will mostly, uh, who mostly do not want to pay the seventeen to $2,000 a year for it, will be forced to buy a policy at a cost of $3,000 even after the premium credits are taken into account. According to the Department of Health and Human Services, 29% of individuals between 18 and 24 are uninsured and 27% of individuals between 25 and 34 are uninsured. This is mostly because prices in the individual market are already high and they do not wish to buy coverage. In other cases, even taking into account subsidies their employers offer to buy group coverage, they still find it too expensive to buy. Due to the age rating in the bill of two to one, the Kaiser Family Foundation has said that a 25-year-old single individual making $30,000 will pay a premium of $3,169, while under the Senate bill, which has a five to one ratio, they would pay $2,258. In short, the bill triggers a $1,000 per year jump in cost. The foundations lay out other examples. 
The easiest example is the 25-year-old making $35,000 a year, which under the House bill will have an increase of $911 per year. For a family of four uh, making $75,000 a year, the premium increase under this legislation would be $700 a year. Now remember, in medicine, the key principle is to do no harm. And this bill will trigger a tremendous premium increase because of the gearing ratios, the two to one or five to one ratio that's in this act. If you do not understand these ratios, you do not understand this bill and why it triggers a higher cost. I think that this, uh, this committee should uh, authorize these amendments. I would just end by asking this question. What is more important for this House to do? To debate and name post offices, of which we have debated and named several dozen, two today, or to debate and uh, consider amendments to the most important legislation of this Congress. I'm from Chicago. I know when the fix is in. The word is you're not going to allow a single amendment. And that's the wrong thing to do, because democracy should not be forced into a little building up on the second floor of the Capitol. It should be in the People's House on the floor of the House of Representatives. But we only debate post office names now and not serious matters. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, the amendment that I present is Fleming 1, a very simple amendment, and it says that uh, members of the House of Representatives and Senate uh, will be required, assuming that there is a public option in this bill, to automatically sign up for it. As you know, uh, in the word, and I've heard uh, in the bill, the word uh, shall comes up something like 3,400 times. We've heard that several times. But it, when it comes to uh, congressmen being part of the public option, the word may is in there, which is actually advance of where it was in 3,200, where it actually opted the congressman out for a period of five years. Let me give you a little background on this. Uh, I'm a family physician over 30 years. I like hearing more primary care, the more the better. We've talked about that a lot this evening. Uh, also a small business owner for over 25 years apart from my medical practice. So I've been dealing with these issues for many years on both sides. And what I've discovered with many of my colleagues is that there are basically two models of controlling costs. And I just want to focus on costs, not coverage for the moment. One is the pre-World War II where we had no insurance and basically it's what you could pay out of pocket and that had a significant control on cost because both the patient and the doctor had a stake in controlling cost. The other is Canada and the UK where government takes care of all cost, in which case the patient and the doctor are totally uh, disconnected with the cost. And so how are costs controlled in those scenarios? Uh, very simply through rationing and long lines, and that's what we see today. So the question is, as we move forward with this bill, how are we going to control cost? Today the model we have is somewhere in between, uh, where patients still have some stake in the cost of their care, but in many cases, uh, particularly with respect to governmental programs like Medicare and especially Medicaid, there's no connection between the patient and cost and therefore the cost rise. With a single payer, uh, or shall I say a public option, which is uh, easily going to involve, evolve into a single payer, what we have is a situation where how do those people get there in the first place? Well, as a, as a small business em, uh, employer, uh, I know what's going to happen here. We're going to have employers looking at a choice. 8% tax to dump their employees into the single payer option, or they're gonna pay the cost of private insurance. Some say that one will be higher than the other. Well, that's a debate. But let me explain something that I rarely hear in this debate. Today as a physician and my colleagues who are in medical practice, what we see is that Medicaid and Medicare pay below cost. And so how is it, and I often hear people say, well, you know, Medicare is a governmental program. Patients love it, and they do love it. But there's a good reason why they love it, because private insurance 
is subsidizing Medicare and Medicaid. If Medicare had to live on its own, we would already have had rationing a long time ago. If it weren't for the private insurance market, uh, then, of course, we wouldn't have it. We would not be in the situation we are today where it's been subsidized. So the net effect of this, uh, Madam Chairwoman, is simply the more governmental medicine that's provided, the more governmental finance medicine we have, the higher the pressure upward is on the cost of private insurance. So as we see the public option in large, which we will, we're going to see an upward pressure of cost in the market for private insurance, not a downward cost, as opposed to what the president says. And what that means is that progressively we'll see a decline in the private insurance market. We'll see an enhancement of the, uh, of the public market, that is, uh, governmental insurance, until finally that's where we're going to end up, with, with essentially a single-payer system. And so how are we going to... Uh, control cost, quite simply, we're going to have to go to rationing and long lines. So I say, as a congressman, if that's the direction we're going to go, then I ask my fellow congressmen to join me and let's all sign up for the public option. Let's join with uh, our fellow Americans because millions of them will be forced into it. Some of you may recall that I introduced House Resolution 615, which was simply a resolution, non-binding, but it simply said, if you vote for the public option or government takeover of health care, you're willing to sign up for it. Now, we had 96 Republican uh, congressmen sign up in support. We've had over 2 million Americans come to my website in support, uh, but we've not had one single Democrat support this. So I think, and, and I think America joins me in this, that we should have Congress both the House and the Senate join us, if we're going to go that direction and we're going to uh, force employers to push their employees off of private insurance and into a government-run system, then we in Congress should join them as well. I thank, thank you. Thank you for your thoughtful testimony, Mr. Klein. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Ranking Members uh, and uh, members of the committee, for giving me the opportunity to testify in support of my amendment to H.R. 3962, the Affordable Health Care for America Act. Along with expanding coverage to 36 million Americans and reducing the deficit, according to the CBO, H.R. 3962 will enact important reforms to Medicare and the Medicare Advantage Program, which allows private insurance plans to participate in Medicare. The health care reform bill will significantly strengthen Medicare benefits for seniors, which is very important to many of us including closing the dreaded donut hole in Part D and allowing the Secretary to negotiate for lower prescription drug prices, long overdue. I have personally, and I know many others, have long championed both ideas as a way to bring down the overall cost of prescription drugs for seniors and strengthen the Medicare program. Mr. Chair, I know that you and other members of this committee um, have been very involved in this work for many, many months and years, and I thank you for doing that. This legislation uh, also takes real steps to not only strengthen and protect Medicare, but I think we can even do better with uh, the proposals on the Medicare Advantage Program. As you know, the Medicare Prescription Drug Improvement and Modernization Act of 2003 created Medicare Advantage and instituted rebates when private plans bid under the benchmark for that year. The rebates consisted of, or consist of, 75% of the difference between the plans bid and the benchmark for that year, with the federal government taking back the remaining 25%, all creating incentives. Make no mistake, I personally believe that there's a place for private insurance plans in the Medicare program. Seniors should have the choice of a private plan administering their Medicare benefits or traditional Medicare. In addition, private plans can institute innovative payment mechanisms that traditional, traditional Medicare may not, and vice versa. But MedPAC, the independent commission established by Congress to study Medicare payment policy, has identified these rebates as overpayments and fully supports leveling the playing field between Medicare Advantage payments and traditional Medicare, which is a way of saving money for the taxpayers and strengthening Medicare I fully support. Section 1161 of H.R. 3962 would begin to phase out Medicare Advantage overpayments in 2011 by instituting a blended benchmark. 
In 2012, overpayments would be further reduced, and in 2013, benchmarks would be equal to Medicare fee-for-service rates. Overall, I do support reforming a Medicare Advantage payment policy going forward with new enrollees and for the areas where the most egregious overpayments are being made. In MedPAC's 2009 report to Congress, it found that each dollar's worth of enhanced benefits in private fee-for-service plans cost Medicare program more than $3. Clearly, areas where benchmarks are set at 120, 130, and even 140 percent of fee-for-service are unsustainable and a clear drain on the benefits that traditional Medicare can provide and the Medicare recipients can receive. For the areas where benchmarks are closer to fee-for-service, however, the system is already operating with some level of efficiency and there are fewer operators driving up costs. Let me be frank, my first priority, as many of us uh, have the same priority, is standing up for our seniors and protecting Medicare. The underlying bill, in my opinion, makes exceptionally strong, positive steps to protect Medicare and the seniors who depend on it, but I believe we can make a good bill even better, and that's why I've introduced this amendment. In order to smooth the transition to a more efficient Medicare Advantage system, my amendment grandfathers in current beneficiaries in counties with 2010 benchmarks at 106 percent of Medicare fee-for-service or less from the changes being proposed in Section 1161. This whole harmless provision would encompass roughly two-thirds of all Medicare Advantage enro enro enrollees nationwide, as well as in my, districts, uh, my district in South Florida. New enrollees would be subject to the equalized benchmarks as outlined in Section 1161, so that going forward, Medicare Advantage plans will compete on a level playing field with traditional Medicare. My amendment would also ease the transition to the Medicare Advantage payment reforms for all current Medicare Advantage beneficiaries by starting reductions to benchmarks in 2012, not 2011. All benchmarks for 2012 will be frozen at 2010 levels to stop the growth of overpayments, which would continue in 2011 as they operate under current law. This one-year transition plan will allow Medicare Advantage plans more time to find efficiencies with their delivery of care so that current beneficiaries will not feel any impact to overpayment reform. These common sense revisions to Section 1161 will strengthen and protect seniors enrolled in Medicare Advantage plans and will help make a good bill better. I urge you to strongly consider my amendment and thank you again for allowing me to testify, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, Mr. Diaz-Bell, any questions? Uh, I want to thank all of uh, our uh, colleagues uh, for their patience coming before us <clears throat> uh, so late, having waited so long uh, to propose your uh, very thoughtful ideas. Uh, I certainly hope that they'll be made in order. We just will hope it springs eternal. Uh, Mr. Scaliza, thank you for fighting for the oyster fisherman. He was extremely upset uh, to see that uh, they, uh, who worked so hard, uh, our targets effect, uh, of uh, bureaucrats uh, with uh, really absurd, really absurd reasons. And it's uh, gratifying to see you, uh, you fighting for them. I thank you all. Uh, Mr. Curie. No Mr. Uh, Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me uh, thank all of you for being here at this late hour and all, and just say that I, as I listened to, to Dr. Fleming, I'm reminded of uh, back in 1994 when we put together our contract with America that some people liked, some people didn't. President Clinton signed about 60 percent of that contract with America into public law. And one of the provisions that we had when we won our majority was the fact that as we looked at the imposition of a wide range of public policies on the American people that we, as members of Congress, should have to live with whatever it is that we inflict on the American people. And you're carrying that spirit forward here. I hope very much that this measure does not become public law, and I know you and I share that view. But the notion of saying to members of Congress who are often seen uh, as being somehow above uh, the American people in many ways, at least there's a perception of that, I think that your effort here is, 
is helping to uh, to address that. Thank you very much, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And I, and I, I it, okay, yeah, no, if I could just, I was, I wasn't going to say anything, but I re respond. I mean, um, the Democratic proposal has been continuously mischaracterized as a as a proposal that would force people into a public option or that would create a single payer system. That is not what it does. Uh, but I do think it is important that members uh, of Congress have the option, just like every American, to be able to choose a public plan or one of the various plans in the exchange. And I think this bill offers that opportunity. So um, I don't think anyone wants to be above the law, but I do think that uh, choice is important. And uh, this is not a bill that forces people into uh, public option, and that has been said over and over and over again. It is may a mischaracterization. You may. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I realize that within the four corners of this bill, it does not say that so-and-so must join the public option. But it sets... So you were surmising. You were surmising then. It doesn't say you have to, but you're going to... You're saying it does. Well, I'm saying that uh, as a physician over 30 years and a small business owner, apart from my practice, that you can see the cascade of events occurring where uh, uh, an employer, you have to understand that every day, those of us in small business, we have to look across the street and look at our competitor and say, what is his overhead against mine? And if it's lower cost to you to dump your employees, pay 8%, put them in the public option, instead of paying 10 or 15% to keep your patients in private insurance, well, what choice are you going to make? So, yes, it doesn't say well, that in the bill, but well, you know I, there are a lot of If I can re re reclaim my time, um, you're, you're assuming that basically insurance companies just roll over and play dead and not want to compete. Um, I, you know, I think they... They enjoy making money. They make a lot of money. Um, I believe they'll be more competitive in, uh, than you do, but we can disagree on that. I just What I wanted to establish is the bill, as it is written, does not require anybody to go into a public option. That's all the only point I wanted to make. You can guesstimate or you can surmise whatever you want. But the bill, respond? But the bill, you did respond. But the bill, you said in the four corners of the bill, it doesn't say that. I just want, that's the only point I wanted to make. Right. Mr. Hastings. Thank you very much. I thank all of, uh, of the witnesses, and I was going to ask Mr. Scalise, Mr. Kirk, and uh, uh, Dr. Fleming if um, their uh, amendments are offered in the Republican substitute. These amendments, the, yes. well, in actuality, the first amendment that I had offered uh, that would require that nobody that makes less than $250,000 would pay a dime in new taxes. Uh, it doesn't need to be offered in the Republican substitute because the Republican substitute doesn't raise any taxes. This bill actually raises $730 billion in taxes, including, as I had pointed out, the 2.5% payroll tax, which Congressional Budget Office said would be about amendment, a $20 billion tax yeah, increase. Is your other amendment make in, less than or in the billion. Republican substitute? Uh, I think uh, Mr. McGovern had asked about the sunset. Uh, I had uh, I'd said that we, uh, we would be happy to entertain that if he would support our no, amendment, we would well, be just in the substitute. interest of time, let me ask Mr. Kirk, uh, please just tell me yes or no whether your uh, amendments are in the Republican substance. The Medical Rights Act, which is patterned after the first paragraph of the Medicare statute, is not in the Republican substitute. Uh, and uh, the uh, limitation on the gearing ratio to limit the cost increases on young people is also not in the Republican uh, substitute. But it, it's interesting to me that for the dozens of post offices, you know, we've sort of let no post office let it go unnamed. Yeah, but we, yeah, we, we, yeah, we do that today, Mr. Kirk. Right. Well, today we actually... I don't know, he asked, asked a question, yeah, but well, I don't you, you didn't answer the question, so I figured I could intervene. Well, uh, it, it, I, I, Mr. Chairman, I didn't interrupt you, but I guess you can interrupt me. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, it, it's regrettable, then, that it wasn't in the substitute, because you had that opportunity, as I did, to try to get things in the manager's amendment on my side. Um, uh, you have every right to be here. I have no problem with that, but I was just concerned. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back in the interest of time. I don't even need to hear. Mr. Um, Sessions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, we're, we're kind of arguing about what is or is not in the bill. Let's make sure we do understand this, that the, um, this bill will make it clear that Americans who do, do not maintain acceptable health insurance coverage and who choose not to pay the bill's new individual mandate 
are subject to numerous civil and criminal, including fed, uh, 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 federal penalties, uh, including criminal fines up to $250,000 and imprisonment up to five years. And let's be very clear that that is true. That is in the bill. Uh, and according to the Congressional Budget Office, the lowest family cost family non-group plan under the Speaker's Bill, and I know we're not supposed to call it the Speaker's Bill now, so we'll call it the Democratic Bill, would cost around $15,000. Uh, there's also a bit of, you know, talk about the table about what's good, what's bad. The top 10 insurance companies in America made $8 billion, evidently, two years ago. And the government lost from fraud alone $60 billion uh, from a, a lesser size bill. Uh, they are not even equal, the insurance companies. And, and, and we, we tend to talk about how evil these companies are, but how inefficient the government is. Uh, the gentleman was talking about how he wants to make sure we lower prescription drug costs. They're already uh, half, almost 40% of what they were projected to be in the Republican bill was half of what the Democrats' prescription drug bill would have been. Gentlemen, yield? I would yield. Well, I, I, I certainly uh, understand the statistics. That no, that's the not, good those are facts. And the good news, the good news is that they're less. But if, if I had to speak to my residents back home right now, I'm sure if you speak to yours, I don't think they're very excited about the cost of prescription drugs in their current price today. So Seniors? the fact that it happens to be a little less than it was or less than projected, that's all good news. But we're paying a lot of money for prescription drugs, a lot more than other countries are. And so I think the fact that the government can do what IBM does when they negotiate masks for a large block, what every Medicaid, 50 states, Medicaid programs do, what the veterans system does, I don't know what Medicaid does, but that seems to be common sense. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, Costco is bigger than all of those that you spoke about. And you're already allowed to go to a nationwide system, and it's far cheaper, and that's why it's been 40% less expensive. Would the gentleman yield? I would yield. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I, I appreciate the fact that Walmart and Costco and other companies have now begun to offer some prescription drugs. At a very that's, that's a wonderful example. Of They've done it since day one. If I can just finish. They don't sell every prescription drug. They don't sell a lot of brands that you and your family may need. They sell for certain prescription drugs that they can bargain for, and that's all good. For those people who have those generics, whatever, there are hundreds of prescription drugs that are not available at Costco. I would love to see them do it. They don't do it. Well, I, I would, uh, you know, I, I, I can't argue that point, but I, I would hard, find it hard to believe that, that the majority of them, they would not because they are large. I do believe that there are some drugs related to chemotherapy and others that probably would fall under that. I would yield to the gentleman. I thank my friend for yielding, and uh, I, I, know, I know it is uh, I know it is very late, but uh, I do think that we we owe respect to the members of the panel who are here. Let me just say, by the way, Ms. Jackson Lee, that I do appreciate very much your recognizing a problem this committee has dealt with. Mr. diaz Villard, Mr. Sessions and I worked very closely with our colleague, former Rules Committee colleague, now the ranking member of the Resources Committee, Mr. Hastings from <coughs> Pasco, Washington, who dealt with the similar issues. So we appreciate your being here on that. But I just wanted to give Dr. Fleming an opportunity to respond. This notion about incentivizing uh, small businesses basically engage in what would be a race to the bottom, uh, compelling their employees to ultimately go into, force them into the public plan because of the fact that uh, it would be the most cost-effective route for small businesses. I think the point that my friend uh, Mr. Fleming was going to make, and I'd like to see if the gentleman would continue to yield, if he would be able to respond to that. I know he wanted to. Yeah, I thank you uh, for yielding. And in fact, it really applies to this discussion uh, that preceded us. And that is what the government intends to do in this bill is to create a false economy, a false competition. For instance, if we thought that Walmart or Costco prices were too high, would it, or even Coca-Cola, for instance, would it make sense for the government to go into business and underprice them and subsidize them? What eventually happens is they collapse and you end up with a government monopoly. Well, that's a single-payer system. So that is really 
The whole point here is that true competition, healthy competition, is among companies that are driving towards a profit of some sort. Even nonprofits still work towards a profit. That's part of the fiber of their of their being. If the you gentleman, continue to yield. But I think the the question had to do with whether or not people are actually being forced into the system as it relates to members. And I think that the argument that you're propounding is that as we see that race to the bottom, small businesses would have a greater incentive to force their employees into the public system uh, because of the, uh, the decreased cost and burden. Absolutely. Remember that the employer pays the majority of the cost of the health care benefit. Well, the employer has to make that decision. It's a business decision. Well, for us in Congress, who is making the majority of that payment? The U.S. government is. So we, uh, paradoxically, ironically, we get the benefit of staying on a private plan, being subsidized by the government, while private business has to go into the government plan because they can no longer compete. And that is really the upside down approach that this bill thank takes. Much. I thank my friend for yielding. I, I, I appreciate the, uh, the gentleman and, and for the response uh, for the gentlewoman who is uh, standing up on behalf of physician-owned uh, hospitals. Uh, I appreciate her work also. We uh, spoke to uh, the chairman earlier. Uh, chairman Rangel was here. Uh, and we spoke about how there was a carve out that was given in the manager's amendment uh, specifically to certain uh, hospitals, uh, physician owned hospitals. Uh, and I spoke with him about that. He generally was unaware of it, he said. Uh, and I am sorry to see that there would be some 38,000 jobs uh, in Texas and over 90 across the United States that really are up and working now or should work but are prevented uh, from, uh, from getting the Medicare uh, code. And uh, I, I'm very hopeful the gentleman is successful in what she does. It's an important element of health care uh, and I'm uh, hopeful that you'll win your amendment. Uh, if I might, I, I think um, and hope that we can find common ground and uh, uh, if there is an opportunity to, uh, from my perspective, we may disagree on this, uh, to provide access to health care, then 36 million people that are going to be added by the bill that I happen to support, I think would benefit from uh, the uh, positions uh, of physician-owned hospitals and their existence. So I, I thank the gentleman. I, I just want to make mention of the fact that the amendment is a grandfathering amendment because the present language uh, in uh, the certificate opportunity, Medicare certificate opportunity, uh, as of January 1st, 2009, and this legislation or this amendment moved to January 1st, 2011. And I do think it would fit very well on all of our goals is to make sure that everyone has universal access to health care. Thank Mr. you. Chairman. Yes. I'd like to ask you names because sent the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Brady, uh, his letter in support of this amendment be included. Without objection. And also, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd ask that uh, the gentleman, Eric Paulson, uh, a letter in support of Amendment Number 38 be included in the record. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back my time. Mr. Perlmutter. Uh, thanks. Oh, I'm sorry. I, 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 I'm sorry. Mr. Curie. Yeah, I'm very brief. Uh, sorry. I have to say your analysis really doesn't uh, make sense to me. I don't understand. Well, uh, it's my understanding that they pay 8% and the employee goes into the public plan. Is that no, not no, correct? They, they, they pay 8% individuals.
the employees then decide if they can go into the exchange and they pay it themselves. Um, but the employee may then say, I'm going to leave this employer and go somewhere else where the employer does pay. So it, it doesn't make sense that simply because this is available, that all of a sudden everyone's going to leave an employer and go into the, the, the insurance. Well, of course, it, it, of course, we've talked a lot about there have been a number of uh, estimates, a uh, number of groups like the Lewin group. Well, the, the, point is, the point is you have a, you have a subsidized system. It's not subsidized. If you're making, if, if, I, if, if I am employed by a particular person, I'm making a certain amount of money, and, and that employer chooses not to let me go into the exchange, if I'm making so much money that I don't qualify for subsidies, then I just go into the exchange, and if he chooses or she chooses not to employ me, I mean, no longer work right, but in the public option, in the exchange, who is backing that? No one is backing it. If I go into the exchange, I'm is the government not backing no, that? The government is not backing it. If I go into the exchange because I can't, because I if it if it loses, no if the if the, if it loses money, you're saying the government does not it's supply. Not, I go into the exchange and I pay for it myself because I don't qualify for subsidy. So that argument that you're making. Just isn't logical. I, I just I, I I would would disagree with the gentleman. The the again the the larger a government system becomes in health, care, whether it's Medicare, Medicaid, the system. if I go into a, the exchange, uh, public I have option, to pay for it. It's going to drive the prices of private insurance upward, not down. Uh, that, that just I yield back. All right, Dr. Fox. I thought Dr. Fleming's uh, explanation was very understandable and uh, very clear and uh, made a lot of sense. In fact, I thought that all of you uh, did a wonderful job of explaining your amendments and uh, the impact on the American people. Thank so, you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Mr. Perlmutter. Um, thanks, Mr. Chair. Just a couple questions. It's getting late. Um, the, um, First, I want to thank my friend from Texas uh, for continuing to pursue the uh, doctor-owned hospital uh, issue that uh, applies to a lot of us. And I guess, Dr. Fleming, here's my question to you. Um, in your practice or in your business, did you have health insurance for yourself? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. And how did your health insurance for your own practice compare to what we get here in the Congress? Just curious. I'm going to turn this around, if that's sure. okay. No, no, I, uh, this I, I is a little you. awkward. Um, my, uh, again, I own businesses apart from my practice and my practice. And uh, we've always been under private insurance, but we noticed about six or seven years. But I mean, uh, and, and let me well, just. Well, I'll get to it quick. It's late, so I'm going to cut to the chase. You know, we have Blue Cross Blue Shield for my law firm. Okay? Yes. My law firm had a nice plan. It was actually better than anything I could get here because here, you know, I have a kid with a chronic illness. You get cut off at 22. Uh, at least with my law firm's plan, it was 25. So I assume you had like a Blue Cross Blue Shield or something like that, right? That is correct, yes. Okay. As I understand this bill, we will create a marketplace that private insurance we hope will participate in. I think they will participate in because there's going to be millions of potential more customers. There will be, as a last resort, a, an option that will be a public option for people, but there should be Blue Cross Blue Shield, Cigna, Aetna, Kaiser, whomever in this thing. Is, I mean, do you understand it differently? Well, may, may I respond to yes. you? Uh, the, the, uh, the President and many Democrats here have said that the main purpose of the public option is to create competition for Correct. private insurance. My point is that when it is backed by the federal government, it is not fair competition. Okay. But see, well, that's we, where you and I, I'll yield to my friend, but I, you and I have a big difference of opinion there. It's not the public option that creates the competition. It's the, it's the exchange right. that creates the competition. And, and I, would, I would say to my friend, I believe, you know, I guess I, I think differently than you. I think the private sector can compete with the public se sector. In Colorado, we have workers' compensation. And for a long time, the private companies, insurance companies, did not want to get into the workers' compensation, and only the state of Colorado would provide workers' compensation. Well, eventually, private companies decided that they could compete, and they competed very well. 
just as you know, potentially a UPS or a Federal Express can compete with the post office. So I guess I have more faith in the private sector and the ability of these insurance companies to, to go straight up against each other and against the public option. So I mean, that's a well, difference. Well, we to have. respond, I would just say I know of no successful model where the federal government goes in with its ability to, to borrow money into the trillions and to make up the difference when it runs a loss against the private sector, which has to compete and doesn't have that ability, where that's ever worked to the benefit of the public. I, I just, I, I mean, I thought with the UPS, Federal Express, well, office, look at I think that has been to the benefit of the public. All right, it's getting late, and you and I will just argue. Now, I, I do have a question for my friend, Mr. Kirk. You went through a number of Kaiser um, sort of statistics for different folks, but for instance, is there a, do you know what it, what it would cost for a 27-year-old female with epilepsy to go out into any of these different plans, or a 55-year-old male who's uh, potentially got prostate troubles? I mean, it seemed to me like you were picking, you know, Mr. Healthy 25-year-old male as uh, part of your um, selection. Right. One of the things that uh, should be known to all of us and what you will hear from your younger constituents, um, because of the gearing ratios in this legislation, your younger constituents are going to hit, be hit with a much bigger bill. If you don't know that, you do need to know that because your 20 and 30 year old constituents are going to start telling you about it Mark, the moment this bill is. You've got to speak more into the mic. Speak into the mic. Oh. Unless that 27 year old has epilepsy. Which case it probably wouldn't be a big no, deal, would it? It's across the board. I, you need to know this about your bill if you don't. So a 27-year-old female with epilepsy is going to pay more Correct. under this bill when you abolish discrimination against pre-existing conditions. Has to, has to under this legislation, because you're you're taking it from a 16 to 1 gearing ratio down to a 2 to 1 gearing ratio. If you do not know this, you do not know your own bill. No. In Thank the you. bill, look at section 211. Right. That which makes it no exclusions, no discrimination based on prior health conditions. Correct. Okay. So are you telling me that she's going to end up paying more than she pays today where she is discriminated against? Absolutely. Boy, in your you bill. and I, I mean... But it's, a, it's actually mathematically a certainty, and you, and you have to know this. And all of your other... You, if you don't you. know about the... This is... Well, let me, guess, right. let me ask you this question. All right, well, tell me what it is. Tell me let what me it ask, is today and what it would be tomorrow under this bill. Let me, let me bill. ask you this question. What is the gearing ratio in this bill, and what is it in the Bacchus bill? I don't know what you're talking about when you say a gearing that is ratio. The, almost I know the, what the dollars are. That's how I deal four with four it. One it's two to one and five to one. Four if you, four four yeah, one. If you do not know that, four you don't know how your own bill works. Well, you no, know, I do it on a pure dollar for dollar basis. And for a dollar for dollar basis, she's going to pay less when there is no discrimination would, against her because of her epilepsy. I would ask you to go to your staff and ask about this concept. So that you understand where Bacchus is different than you. You will then begin to understand why the bills are different than what's currently. Well, no, I don't care about between Bacchus and this bill. I care a bit about the bill and today, the system today. Correct. The and si the system today discriminates against her and charges her, an, an, in my opinion, an outrageous amount of money if she can get it. And it must charge her even more under the House oh. bill. It charges are slightly less under the Senate. No, that's absolutely the case. Well, your, your staff will explain it to you, but that's right. absolutely what the bill mandates. Um, Last question, just to uh, respond to my friend. I would think differently, too, is again, as he was talking about the uh, penalty uh, being potentially jail time. He is correct for somebody who practices tax evasion. That's for any tax where there's evasion. It's willful tax evasion, and my friend uh, from New York as a district attorney can describe what willful means. And so it's tax evasion. 
Gentleman yield. I'll yield first to my friend from New York and then we can see the definition of use is for willfulness is voluntary intentional violation of no legal duty. Uh, it's not a good faith mis misunderstanding of law or good faith belief not violating the law. Uh, so even if not reasonable. So I mean obviously there's a big difference between uh, my friend Mr. Sessions' example of a person forgetting to pay it, that's not what the definition is, that's a will probably not do it, which is dramatically different than forgetting negligently. I mean, the, the standard of proof is totally different, willful as opposed to negligent. I, I, I never said anything of the sort. I said that there would be circumstances that I could even envision and understand where I. Uh, with a disabled child, I may have to pay $3,000 out of pocket other than the health care to take care of my child, and I may choose not to have the government plan, but would still choose to have my own insurance that might be major medical, because I might, might be 35 years old or 40, but I don't have enough money. Right. No, 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 hold, hold on. It's exactly because I would make a willful decision that, listen to me, that I would choose not to get the government plan. And it says right here, I would be making a decision not to, not to maintain an acceptable health insurance coverage. And I would make that because if I don't have the money, then I will just choose to do whatever I can do. And that is willful, my friend. That's an exception. Wait, will the gentleman yield for a second? Where's the exception? Will the gentleman yield? All, all that would occur is that you, you have to pay an additional 2.5% income tax. And yes, if you don't pay any of your income tax, what about the 36% the 30, the the 35% you pay? It just means the rate is 2.5% higher. What we're talking about. And if you, you don't pay. Said, yeah. If I willfully choose not to pay the 2% tax, all of your income tax. No, not forget that. If you, if, if, okay, so, listen, listen, well, okay. Hey, everything I'm if you don't have, if you, were, if you don't get the insurance excuse for your child, me. one at a time, what, what, hey, excuse, excuse me, excuse me. Who don't pay the income tax? Hey, one at a time. The person who's transcribing this can't. It's very, very late. I appreciate it. It's not too late, Ed, to understand. Well, excuse me, excuse me. I'm sorry, I thought you gave it to me. I did, and I'm taking it back. Mr. Pro has the time. Mr. Polis. I'll be brief. Um, with regards to um, some comments that were made earlier by Dr. Fleming, I wanted to clarify. Um, I was in business before I got here, ran some, several small businesses. Right now, there is no penalty at all uh, if you don't cover your employees. It's subject to the supply, you know, supply and demand in the labor market. Many businesses, I come from the tech industry, we had to cover our employees or we wouldn't attract good employees. But there's no penalty at all if we don't cover them. Under this proposed bill, there is an 8% payroll tax. So we initiate a penalty for uh, companies who don't do it. That is an extra reason for companies to do it, not a comp reason for companies to drop coverage. It's actually an extra incentive for the first time ever there's actually a penalty beyond the regular supply and demand of the labor market, a penalty above and beyond that uh, if you fail to cover your employees. Now again, if a company fails to cover their employees and pays the 8% tax, that does not mean their employees receive some kind of free pu coverage or wind up on the public ops or anything like that. They have no coverage, just as they would today. The company pays a penalty. The employees are then on their own to be able to go to the exchange. Uh, it's not that they go to the public option. They go to the exchange. One of the options in there may or may not be the public option, depending on whether that's uh, it's in this bill, of course. I, I don't know. It's not in the Senate bill. Uh, but there are many different private options in there. So again, uh, it is my belief, based on my experience in the private sector, that more companies will uh, cover their employees because they will, for the first time ever, face a penalty if they don't. And I just wanted to make that point. Uh, you yes, would like to make response? if you'd like to. Uh, yeah, I thank the gentleman for clarifying that. Um, well, you know, today uh, among small businesses, still about half of them do not provide uh, insurance for their employees. So uh, what guarantee does this bill provide that even if they pay the 8 percent that uh, I mean, you know, if an employer can get by with 8% instead of paying 15% of payroll, then why shouldn't they do that? 
No, again, the, right now they pay 0% penalty for not covering their employees. So they Even if it was a 1% penalty rather than 8%, the fact is more businesses will cover. Let's say it was a 1% penalty. You say, well, what if they can't they get by by paying the 1% instead of the 15%? Right now it's 0% instead of 15%. So, you so you're 0%. saying we should penalize businesses more? Well, I'm fine with 8%. I mean, I'd be fine with well, 6%, you know, whatever it is. 8, and you don't think that has any impact on employment? Well, it's 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 if you add eight percent of payroll to cost to an uh, to a company, uh, you know the employers. No, gonna again, have mo what, what I hear from most companies in, in in the industries I was in, it was the norm to cover your employees. In other industries, it's not. And one of the things I hear from my small businesses in my district in those areas, hey, if you make my competitors do it, then then I can do it. But I can't do it unilaterally because when I bid on a project, if I'm covering my employees, my competitors not, they're going to underbid me. But if everybody does it, then they don't have that, that, that disadvantage. So that's the type of thing well, I, I Again, I, I just philosophically can't understand why in the world the U.S. government would want to put uh, a f fine a business 8% uh, and, and still have nothing to show for it. I mean, to me, uh, with an unemployment rate of 10.2%, uh, mm -hmm. now we want to talk about a 2.5% tax on people for not buying into the insurance, and then 8% and then 8% on an employment. Well, again, I think the, the goal and the vast majority How of How are we ever going to get to employment by I, doing that? Again, I, there's a figure. I don't have it in front of me. I believe it's around 90% of companies already provide benefits. Well, and, and again, we've and got overseas competitors that we've got to deal with. Don't you all care yeah. this outside? Yeah, I'll yield back. <laughs> you, you, you'll have a vote to vote on the status quo tomorrow as well. Um, I thank you all very much for coming. No further questions? Thank you. Chairman, I ask unanimous. Without objection. Submit. Without, table three into the record. Without objection. Um, I think we. I think we have one. Is it one final panel? Mr. Stupak, uh, Mr. Uh, Pitts, Mr. Smith, Ms. Del Kemper, uh, Ms. Kaptur, and Sid Smith. Yeah. Am I correct that you're all on the same panel? Correct. Right. All right. Anybody else I'm missing here? Ms. Uh, Dr. Fox. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Who, uh, who's going to be the lead off here? Mr. Stupak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Dreyer. And thank you to my colleagues for their courage and commitment in sitting through this uh, hearing tonight and all they've done in helping us to get to this point where we're now before the Rules Committee to offer our amendment. I want to thank the speaker and the Majority Leader Hoyer. Throughout these last few weeks, we've worked very, very hard to try to resolve this issue of public funding for abortion. We came to the point where we actually had an agreement tonight, but unfortunately it fell apart. So that's why we've had to scramble to be here. I, I regret that uh, the agreement fell apart. Um, I think everyone meant well, and I'm not here to place blame on anyone. So we're to the point now where we're back to where we started back in July when it came before the Energy and Commerce Committee in which we offered our amendment which said no public funding for abortion, which is the current law and that law should remain. So we're asking that our amendment, the Stupak, Pitts, Captor, Smith, Dahlkemper amendment be made in order because it does one very simple thing. It applies the current law, the Hyde Amendment, which bars federal funding for abortion except in the case of rape, incest, or life for the mother to the health care reform bill. The Hyde Amendment has been the law of the land since 1977 and applies to all federally funded health care programs, including SCHIP, Medicare, Medicaid, Indian Health Service, Veterans Health, Military Health Care Programs, and Federal Employees Health Benefit Program. You're all familiar with our pro-life members and the change that we are seeking to this bill. As I said, we wish to maintain current law which says no public funding for abortion. So let me begin by clearly articulating what this amendment does not do. First, our amendment does not prevent any private insurer from selling a policy which covers abortion. This ensures that those who want abortion coverage have access to it without forcing anyone or anyone else to pay for another one's abortion with their tax dollars or with their private funds. Second, our amendment does not prevent any individual 
from purchasing a plan that covers abortion as long as their coverage is not subsidized with affordability credits. Third, and I stress this point because it's a common misconception about our amendment. Our amendment does not prevent an insurer participating in the exchange from selling health plans in the exchange that include elective abortions so long as no subsidies are used to purchase their policy and the insurer offers an, an identical plan without elective abortion coverage to subsidize purchasers. Our amendment simply applies current law, the Hyde Amendment, to the public health insurance option and a private policies purchase using affordability credits. We are not writing a new federal abortion policy. The Hyde Amendment prohibits federal funding for abortion as well as federal funding for health care policies that cover abortion. This policy currently applies to 8 million Americans, including members of Congress covered under the Federal Employees Health Benefit Program and should apply in this bill also. Some might ask why our amendment is necessary if Hyde is in existing law. The answer is funding in H.R. 3962 is not subject to the annual appropriations law and therefore is not subject to the Hyde provisions contained in the annual labor HHS bill. The only way to provide Hyde protection of no public funding for abortion in the health insurance option and subsidies in the form of affordability credit found in this bill is to, is to insert the Hyde language into this legislation. Neither the so-called CAPS amendment <coughs> language contained in 3962 nor any of the so-called compromises that have been circulated in recent days hold true to letter or the intent of current law on federal funding of abortion. Those compromises were fully vetted tonight. We thought we had an agreement, unfortunately it did not work. New and complicated accounting mechanisms which is found in the CAPS language and every compromise that's been circulated provide the appearance that monies in the exchange are not federal funds. The fact is the health care policies that cover abortion will be subsidized through affordability credits using taxpayer dollars. In fact, the underlying accounting scheme found on pages 97 and 98 holds that policyholders will be forced to pay an abortion surcharge of $12 a year or $1 per month per enrollee. The public option operated under the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in the same way as Medicare will draw funds from the federal treasury account authorized under Section 322 of this bill. Regardless of how they're collected, these funds are paid from the U.S. Treasury, our federal funds. Allowing funding for abortion through the public option, as the bill currently does, re represents a clear departure from longstanding policy by authorizing federal government to pay for elective abortion first time in decades. Members of this committee, all we're asking on behalf of the majority of the House that supports the inclusion of the Hyde Amendment is an opportunity for our voices to be heard. If you do not allow our amendment to even be voted on during the floor consideration, you're science silencing a considerable member, probably the majority of the members of this body who have deep convictions on this issue. Some reference has been made tonight about Speaker Pelosi and what she said as she ascended to the speakership. And what she said at one time, and I quote, is, the voice of every American has a right to be heard. No member of Congress should be silenced on the floor. So on behalf of every American, I wish to be heard on the sanctity of life. Even President Obama, in an address to the nation, to the American people, in this body said, and I quote, under our plan, no federal dollars will be used to fund an abortion. I hold the President to these words, no federal dollars no matter how you try to disguise it, should be used in this legislation to fund abortion. I personally feel that now is the time to pass health care reform and ensure quality, affordable health care for all Americans. It is not the time to rewrite the policy on federal funding for abortion. So let's keep current law. It is not the time to rewrite this policy. Abortion funding policies contained in 3962 jeopardizes the fate of the rule being considered here today and the underlying bill. I urge the Rules Committee to accept the Stupak, Pitts, Capture, Smith, and Dal Kemper Amendment for consideration on the floor so we can move forward to finally provide Americans with affordable, quality health care for all Americans. I look forward to your questions, and once again, I thank my colleagues. I'd next ask if Mr. Pitts could be uh, Mr. recognized. Pitts. This is a bipartisan amendment.
rules that repeatedly shown that the public does not support federal funding for abortion. Yet that is exactly what is in this bill. H.R. 3962 would explicitly authorize the Secretary of Health and Human Services to include abortion in the public plan. By authorizing the public plan to cover abortion, this bill will break with long-standing current policy. Current law actually prevents any federal health care plan from paying for abortion. It also prevents taxpayer subsidies from flowing to plans that include abortion. However, the TAPS amendment included in this legislation would have the exact opposite effect. It would allow federal funding of abortion under the public plan, and it would allow taxpayer subsidies known as affordability credits to flow to plans that include abortion. The question about whether any government health care programs currently provide coverage for elective abortion, Chairman Waxman's legislative council confirmed that they do not. Not SGIP, not Medicaid, not DOD, not FDA-CT, all because of congressional action to explicitly prohibit coverage of abortion under each of these programs. But such an explicit exclusion is missing from this bill. And no matter what kind of accounting scheme or contracting gimmick is put in place, the fact remains that if the government plan covers abortion, that amounts to federal funding for abortion. It's that simple. Congressman Stupak and I, along with co-sponsors Smith, Gull, and Perkett, are offering an amendment that would maintain the principles of the Hyde Amendment, something that the large majority of Americans support. Our amendment states that no federal funds can be used to pay for abortion or for plans that cover abortion. It makes crystal clear that the government plan should not include abortion, a principle that the American people agree with. The recent Rasmussen poll showed that only 13% of Americans want abortion funding in this bill. Representative Stupak and I and our co-sponsors are merely requesting a floor vote, an up or down vote, on an amendment that would maintain current policy by preventing government-funded abortion in health care reform. I urge your support of this bipartisan amendment. Thank you for your patience. Mr. Chairman, with your permission, Mr. Lipinski has also joined us. He's one of the co-sponsors and has worked hard on this amendment. I guess uh, Ms. Kapter was going to go next. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, for your endurance. And uh, I am very pleased to join my colleagues here this evening. Uh, let me just, uh, in order to use the time effectively, thank the speaker and all those who worked so very hard to try to reach an accommodation so we didn't have to be here uh, at midnight Washington time. Uh, we are sorry that could not be done. Uh, my plea to you tonight is to allow this amendment so that the uh, consensus of the American people after 34 years of struggling with this extraordinarily compelling issue will be reassured that we are not moving beyond existing law. We are only assuring existing law is placed in this bill in order that we maintain the Hyde Amendment to prohibit funding uh, in the case of elective abortion uh, and for plans which include elective abortion. It's very similar to, um, and many people forget the second part of that, it's very similar to what we do under the Federal uh, Employee Health Benefits Plan. And um, we're just asking that this be applied um, to this current legislation. And we want to make it possible to reassure the American people that we are not moving beyond existing law. We are merely reaffirming existing law. I thank you very much for your consideration this evening. <coughs> thank Mr. You. Smith. I don't want to uh, repeat what my distinguished colleagues have said, and they've said it so eloquently. And I want to thank them for their leadership, uh, including my good friend and colleague, Mr. Stupak, who uh, co-chairs the Congressional Pro-Life Caucus <clears throat> along with me. It's a bipartisan caucus believing that the sanctity of, of human life uh, trumps all politics uh, and partisanship, and we need to affirm and protect the most fundamental of all human rights. You know, in 2009, more and more Americans are recognizing that abortion is indeed violence against children, it exploits women, 
And now we know, based on three recent studies, that subsequent children born to women who have abortions risk and severely risk prematurity by about 35% for any subsequent children. And if they have two abortions, it jumps up. It skyrockets to over 90%. One of the leading causes of mental and motor retardation is prematurity. We are guaranteeing that many children born subsequently uh, to women who have abortions will endure hardship and disability. In 1983, Mr. Chairman, and I look up at the picture, that wonderful picture of former Chairman Joe Moakley. Joe Moakley, David Bonnier, and my good friend and colleague uh, who, with whom uh, you and I, Mr. Chairman, have worked so much on, on, um, on hunger issues, we offered, I offered an amendment to the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program to bar funding under that program for abortion. It was enacted into law in 1983, and as Ms. Kaptur said so well, we are trying to take the Hyde Amendment, the S-CHIP program prohibition on abortion, the government-wide uh, prohibitions on abortion, and apply it to the two brand new programs created in this pending legislation. The Hyde Amendment doesn't apply currently. The CAPS Amendment does not reach. The affordability credits uh, uh, program and the public option, two brand new massive programs will, without the Stupac, Joe Pitts amendment, co-sponsored by the rest of us, uh, will be providing for public funding for abortion. Joe Pitts, I believe, mentioned the Rasmussen poll. Every single poll shows super majorities of Americans do not want health care subsidize abortion in health care. They don't want it. They say it clearly, unmistakably. And again, when Tony Hall, Joe Moakley, and David Bonnier supported that amendment to the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program, it was an extension of that concept that we can agree or disagree on major aspects of this bill, but abortion is not health care. We should not be enabling it, facilitating it, and paying for it. Finally, and I'll finish on this. Planned Parenthood, again, has reiterated that when public funding is not available for abortions, 25% of those women who would otherwise procure an abortion does not get it. 25%. There are millions of children in this capital, throughout the United States of America, and many of them are young adults now, who did not have their lives snuffed out simply because the public funding was not available to facilitate their demise. Some of them watched the Yankee game the other day. Some of them were the World Series. Some of them are probably working here on Capitol Hill. We, we don't know, but the money wasn't there to effectuate their destruction. President Obama said he wants to reduce abortions. By denying public funding for abortions, that is one of the most efficacious ways of doing so, and respectfully ask that this amendment be made in order. We've been here. We're all fatigued. We've, we've heard all the arguments. I just ask all our colleagues to be respectful and just do as much as we can to not repeat over and over. Thank you. That's the truth. So I just want to say that. Thank you. Don't, don't be intimidated by no. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I appreciate it. No, I appreciate it. Yeah. I will be brief, and I will just be honest. I want to thank the chairman and the ranking member, and I want to thank the committee for your time, your dedication to the work that you do here in Congress. And um, I also want to vote and, and represent their constituency with that vote 
And I'm also going to ask the members of Congress from both sides of the aisle, once that's done, to support this bill, which I also believe is a pro-life bill. Thank you. Mr. Lipinski. It was also very good to know you know that everything has been said, but uh, everyone hasn't said it yet. Don't worry, I'm not going to repeat everything. I just want to thank the committee uh, for all their work for a long, long day. Uh, I just want to ask you, you know, all of us up here, my colleagues, I thank them for all the work that they do. Just to see that, you know, especially in a difficult week for him, uh, all of his work, I just want to ask the committee to allow consideration I don't, I, it sounds like you have already ha spoken with the speaker and the leadership and you've come to some sort of an agreement. I, I just have a couple of just questions of clarification. If someone were to join the public option, would they not be, would, would they be ineligible to have an abortion? If they, if, is the public option totally ban abortion? So they have affordability credits, but then they, they doesn't pay for the entire, uh, but they pay for some of it out of their own pocket. But if they have affordability credits, then, then they're denied the ability to have an abortion. Our amendment allows a supplemental in there if you want to. I get affordability credits. Yeah. If I still want to buy additional coverage on my own money, with yeah. my own money, I can do that. I guess the, I guess the point that one might make is that um, it's okay if you're, okay, you know, if you have the money. Um, if you could afford a supplemental package, why would you need the affordability credits? The issue is, what about poor women who find themselves in a situation where, uh, where they have to make that awful choice? Our policy has always been in this country, we do not pay for the federal government's policy. The federal government do not pay for abortions. We do not use your money or my money to right. pay for abortions. And I understand that. Right. But I, 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 what I'm trying to get at it is that not all the money that goes into the public option is federal money. It's not all my tax money, not all your tax money. Um, and so I'm just, I, you know, I, I, I guess the point I'm trying to make is the older, I, I used to think life was black and white. The older I get, the more gray life becomes. And I get really nervous, quite frankly, when we make these black and white decisions up here. Um, because in, at the end, um, someone ends up getting hurt, not intentionally. No, I, 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 I understand it, but if it, right, right, but you join the public option, you know, I may be paying money, I, you know, I'm, some of the money I pay is mine, not taxpayer money. I guess that's my, that's my point. I'm, I'm just uneasy with the whole policy. I, I understand it. Look, I have respect for everybody up on, the, on this uh, table. I work with all of you on human rights issues and, you know, on a whole range of other issues, so I'm not trying to be difficult. It's just that I find this amendment uh, very, very uncomfortable for me to, yes, Mr. Pence. Right, but, but the public op the public option is different than Medicaid, and 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 the the idea of being able to purchase supplemental insurance, I, I get that concept, but you need to have money to be able to purchase supplemental insurance. And if you're a poor woman, it, it you does know, not change existing law. You may purchase supplemental insurance, but no federal funds. No, and pay for the well, we we maintain the current. I think I get it. I guess the difference is I'm making a distinction between Medicaid and the public option, and um, and 
making the point that to buy supplemental insurance is an added expense, and if I could afford supplemental insurance, that I probably wouldn't need a, you know, a any kind of a subsidy. But I, I get it. I, I understand where you're coming from. I, yeah, yeah, sure. I think with the public option and with the affordability credits, uh, families, women, men across this country will be much more able to afford insurance that they didn't have before for those especially vulnerable Americans that you're talking about. Uh, many states have riders uh, for those who wish to purchase uh, abortion coverage separately, and it's quite <coughs> inexpensive, actually. So I think that if you take care of the whole person and their insurance, I think it'll become uh, less of a constraint, as you're saying, if anyone would want to purchase that. But I think now uh, mothers will want to bring their children right. to term because they so will have insurance. I yield to the gentleman. What, what does Ms. would a 16-year-old girl have to do? She'd have to go to her mother and ask her mother to buy a rider for the uh, necessary insurance? Well, I think it depends on the family situation. And that's exactly yeah. the point. And All of times, these things depend on family situation. Right. And um, many times the judge, the, um, in, in some cases, there would have to be judicial override locally if there is abuse in the family or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it, it isn't something I can give a blanket statement on. Mm -hmm. I could offer a hundred hypotheticals. Um, all of us have been down this path. But the one thing that I believe um, will ultimately occur um, in this uh, particular process, and like Mr. McGovern, I have great respect for all of you. Um, I don't know Ms. Dahlkamp as well as I do the rest of you, and I've worked all over the world with uh, Mr. Smith and many of you, and I will continue uh, that respect. But in my judgment, having had the experience of seeing the horror of uh, women in back alleys and using court hangers, coat hangers, um, and all sorts of substances, um, I foresee for poor women in America uh, a return to the dark ages. And that's what I believe this um, uh, amendment does in this country. We've progressed fairly well, uh, but now we take a giant step backward, and I'm not only uncomfortable, it brings me to a point where if this goes to the Senate and comes back, then it's going to be very difficult for the Speaker or anybody else to get me to vote for health care. And that's where you all, um, um, you know, you're using absolutely confirmed moral convictions that all of you, as are all of us, are entitled to. And I would not question your integrity with reference to the moral convictions. But when you look at the larger picture, the whole, then I think um, it's going to be very difficult for all of the good things that are in this bill that take us uh, to a level uh, that will protect uh, a significant number of people. Now we come to this, and um, I, I'm 73, and I've seen these dark things. I've seen women in college with me that use coat hangers that died. And so you give them these kinds of circumstances and freeze everything else, and you're going to find yourself in the same position that we were in in 1953 when I went to college, and in 1954, the first of three girls that died uh, because of uh, using back alley approaches uh, to something that she and her doctor should have been able to make a decision about it. I thank the gentleman for you. Thank you. I appreciate um, the opportunity to respond. Um, this is not in any way changing the law, the law of the land today. Um, and currently, all the programs, for example, a, uh, you mentioned a 16-year-old girl may be on S-CHIP. Uh, there is no federal provision for abortion coverage with an S-CHIP. There is none for all of us probably in this room if we are on the federal employees insurance and we all pay into it our private dollars but there's no opportunity unless we would buy additional coverage. Um, so this is not changing the precedent of today. It's not outlawing abortion in any way and in fact the vast majority of abortions today are paid for with cash not through a private health care program and none of us want to see what you're describing 
And I, and I say this as a woman who found myself pregnant and unmarried and went you know, through this very difficult time in, in making a decision. But I, I say this because I do not believe this is going to change the law. I actually think it's going to help reduce abortions, which I believe is something that everyone in this room wants to see happen. Well, I hope you're right. I mean, I, I, my, my worry is that I think, I, I feel like we're creeping beyond the high language, but we, we can argue here all night. Um, I respect everybody on this panel. Um, you know, I, if, it, if this amendment is allowed, I, allowed I, I'm certainly going to vote against it. And, uh, and, uh, but uh, anyway, be that as it may, Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I believe that this simply reaffirms the uh, current law. And uh, I think that, again, as you all have pointed out, an overwhelming majority of, of Americans believe that the federal government should not be taking tax dollars and utilizing them in any way, in any way, shape, or form uh, to promote abortion. And I've always felt that I, I can't take the tax dollars of a devout Roman Catholic who believes that life begins at the moment of conception and utilize those dollars uh, for abortion. And uh, so I hope very much that your amendment's made in order, and uh, when it is, I'll probably vote in support of it. Thank you very much for being here. Mr. Cardozo. Mr. Diaz Thank you all for coming. I look forward to supporting you. Mr. Curie. Mr. Sessions. I thank each of you, and I'm in full support of what you're doing, uh, and believe that uh, believe we must be done. Mr. Perlmutter. Dr. Fox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all of you for your steadfastness on this issue and your courage. Uh, I, I think uh, all of us are the better for the um, stand you've taken. I certainly agree with you and uh, will do everything I can to see that uh, your amendment is made in order and passes on the floor. So thank you all very much for what you've done. That's it. Thank you very much for being here. We appreciate it very much. Um, we, uh, well, Mr. Mr. King is here. Um, Mr. King, I think, has 13 amendments. Do you want to, Dr. Fox, go before? Uh, would you guys, do you want to go before Mr. King, or do you want to have him do his 13 amendments? And Okay, then we'll yield to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll thank my colleagues. I will, I will be um, fairly quick on this. The amendment's fairly short. Um, it directs the Secretary of Health and Human Services to extend for two years the reclassification in effect during fiscal year 2009 for hospitals whose Medicare Geographic Classification Review Board reclassification changed from fiscal year 2009 to fiscal year 2010 or ended as of September 30, 2009. The affected hospitals would have 20 days from enactment and publication of this provision to notify the Secretary of their decision to extend their fiscal 2009 reclassification. This is a temporary extension any Medicare Geographic Classification Review Board reclassification that these hospitals have or will obtain for fiscal years beyond, beyond the two-year extension will remain valid. We have 55 hospitals all across the country who fall into this category. Till the question came up earlier, I hadn't bothered to count Democrats and Republicans, but I thought somebody might ask. Um, there are 33 uh, Democratic members, 22 Republican members, who are affected by this. Um, and basically, it has to do with where with wages that are paid in the hospitals and where the hospitals fit into the MSA. It's a very complicated and very esoteric thing. Uh, but I would ask for your support on it. We've worked um, with some other members to try to get it into the bill. What got into the bill was not exactly what needed to be done. And so I ask uh, for I, your indulgence. I appreciate it. Any questions of Dr. Thank Fox? You. Thank you very much. Mr. Sessions. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, earlier this evening I engaged in a discussion with the gentleman, Mr. Uh, uh, Camp, uh, as well as the uh, chairman of the uh, Ways and Means Committee about what type of analysis had been done uh, related to uh, looking at what jobs or what the impact on jobs would be. And thus, my amendment would not allow any of the provisions of the bill to be implemented if the Office of the Management and Budget, in consultation with the Department of Labor, found that four million or more jobs will be, would be lost as a result of this bill. Uh, as I had stated to, to uh, the, the uh, gentleman, uh, Mr. Rangel, uh, and he encouraged me to uh, send a letter asking that, uh, based upon this bill, that we find out what uh, what uh, Office of Management Budget or, or CBO would say about the scoring of this bill for uh, numbers of jobs and that impact. Uh, and so I would ask this amendment, uh, since we've been told by the chairman he's sure that it will score out millions of jobs would be added, that if it turned out to be the reverse, where we're losing, Four million or more jobs, which I fe feel is a fair high threshold as opposed to a loss of any jobs, uh, that we would not move forward with the bill. Thank you very much. Any questions of Mr. Session? Thank you very much. Mr. King? We'd appreciate it if you'd summarize your amendments. Mr. Chairman, you'll appreciate it that I have all of those amendments on uh, three pieces of paper in Terrific. summary form. And uh, I think, uh, am I, Mr. Chairman, the last one before the Rules Committee tonight? Uh, okay, well, thank you. I'll, I'll keep that in mind as well. Um, <clears throat> there are uh, the series of amendments that I have. Uh, offered here this evening. Uh, I'll take them down through the list. Uh, uh, King number one is the amendment that um, the, the, the amendment would require that beneficiaries of the insurance exchange provide proof of their citizenship. We have had a deep discussion about this. It happens to be a centerpiece of a national controversy. We have heard from the president that uh, he doesn't want a bill that will fund illegals. Um, many of us have looked at this language. It's been the subject of intense debate in the Energy and Commerce Committee and on the Ways and Means Committee. And King Amendment Number 1 reverts the language back to the standards for proof of citizenship that existed before the S-CHIP expansion was signed into law most recently. It was proof-tested language from 1996. It worked well. Requirement birth certificate and other documents. So King Number 1. Um, it will establish that this legislation doesn't fund, doesn't fund illegals. And again, consistent with the President's position, my position, and that of a significant majority of this House of Representatives. Uh, King number two would remove the bill's allowance for members of a household to receive affordability tax credits if only one person in the household actually um, were eligible. And this is another component of how this would be another component of how illegals can be and would be funded if this legislation becomes law. In fact, uh, Mr. Speaker, it, it says in, in uh, the section of the bill that we go to amend, and I will quote from it, members of the same family who are, afford who are affordable tax credit eligible individuals shall be treated as a single affordable credit individual eligible for applicable credit for such a family under this subtitle, which just means if there's an individual in the household considered a family unit, then one individual that qualifies, all individuals may be considered that um, and likely would be. So that's, that's king number two. And the data that we're looking at says that about two million families in the U.S. have uh, one or more illegal immigrant parents with U.S.-born children. There's how the qualifying comes in and happens. So uh, number one reiterates the, uh, reestablishes the citizenship requirement. King number two strikes the language that would allow everyone in the household to qualify if one person in the household were legal and lawfully present in the United States and under other standards. King number three, the amendment would strike the provision in the bill that would prohibit the sale of private health insurance uh, policies. And uh, 
We know that those policies will end up uh, sunsetting in 2013, and every single health insurance policy, uh, individual health insurance policy in America would have to be written to comply with the rules that would be written by the new uh, Health Choices Administration Commissioner. But this would strike that component, that requirement in the bill, and it allow people to actually keep the insurance policies that they have today rather than be guaranteed that they will be canceled at the end of the terms that are written in this bill. King number four would insert the text of H.R. 3422 into the bill, and that will provide for an increase in payments to the what we've described as the tweener hospitals. Congressman Latham and I have introduced legislation, and it's called H.R. 3422. Uh, we have hospitals that are just a little bit too big to uh, qualify under the critical access language and uh, too small to be efficient enough to be able to accept the low Medicare reimbursement rates. And, and in my particular position, I believe I represent the most senior congressional district in America, that of the states, Iowa has the highest percentage of its states over the uh, had highest percentage of its residents over the age of 85. And in the 99 counties in the state of Iowa, I represent 10 of the 12 most senior counties in Iowa. We are hard hit by a half a trillion dollar cut in Medicare. And access to health care is critical to us. Just getting people to the nearest health care service is critical to us. And these tweener hospitals that Congressman Latham and I have stepped up uh, to advocate for, I strongly urge that, that we include the consideration of that. And... Uh, King number five just simply uh, takes us right to a philosophical point that's exactly in the heart of this legislation. It removes the government option. It strikes the component of the bill, which is uh, subtitle B of Title III, and that, that does establish the government-run insurance program. And so it, it preserves, by doing so, it preserves the private sector. We have, in this country, 1,300 health insurance companies. That's not policies, that's companies. And those companies provide a variety of approximately 100,000 different policy combinations that can be purchased by the individual. The problem that we have, of course, is that we can't, that isn't always all 100,000 policies aren't available to each person because they, that's, the, that's the total among the 50 states. And I presume that someone else has offered the amendment to allow for purchase of health insurance across state lines. But 1,300 companies, 100,000 policies, we don't need one more policy written by the federal government or a variety of the federal government to create competition. And uh, we know the history of what's happened when we've seen the government engage in competition against the private sector. We've seen the, the sample that I will disagree on the policy, but I think not on the results. Um, we started out with government competition and student loans, and essentially that will be wrapped up and packaged up and gone in a very short period of time. But the very distinct and definitive example that's before us when the federal government steps in to engage in competition with the private sector is exampled in 1968 when the federal government passed the, uh, the federal flood insurance program. At that time, the day that that bill was passed, we had private sector property and casualty companies that were selling flood insurance. But today, there's only one kind of policy you can buy for flood insurance, and that's a federal policy. That's the destiny of this bill. I know many of you know that, and that's your goal. I'm opposed to that because I want Americans to have the choice and not have, in the end, a single-payer plan. And, and that's King, five, King Amendment number five. King, King Amendment number six, it strikes section 1701 from the bill, which provide, would provide for a significant increase in Medicaid eligibility. Now, this is the section of the bill, 1701, that pushes about $34 billion in, in additional Medicaid costs down to the states. That raises the, the eligibility of the poverty level of 150 percent. That totals out at $34 billion. That's what has lit up the governors across the state to take on this burden at a time when they're seeing their coffers empty. States like California, I would think, would be very sensitive to this issue. And uh, so that, that would strike the section that raises Medicaid eligibility. King number seven would strike section 1161 is in a section which would bring about significant cuts in the Medicare Advantage program. 
It's another program that's important to the, especially the states that have a lot of senior citizens, and, and Iowa being among them. And this is uh, the numbers that spread are somewhere between 150 and 163 billion dollars that it takes out of the Medicare Advantage program. Many of us think that it kills the Medicare Advantage program, and uh, I know that's been a goal of some of the members of this Congress. It's in the bill. It essentially kills the Medicare Advantage program. That's something that my constituents have have wanted. That they that they have actually managed very well, and it's been very useful to our senior citizens. So King 07 strikes a section that essentially eliminates Medicare Advantage program and preserves Medicare Advantage, so people have options. King 08, the amendment would remove Section 223 from the bill, which establishes the Health Benefits Advisory Committee, and it's an attempt to reduce some of the bureaucracy because the Health Benefits Advisory Committee would dictate health plans that all, ind all individuals much pr must purchase. And uh, that would be consistent in keeping with the, some of the other amendments. Um, I want people to have choices in the private sector. And that's why this list comes before you. And we all know this is serious business or you wouldn't be sitting here at this time of the morning. King 09 is an amendment which will remove the section on comparative effectiveness research in the bill. Another attempt to reduce unnecessary burden of bureaucracy. The bill includes no provisions preventing the government-run health care plan from using this research to deny access to life-saving treatments. Uh, and that, that would be if it were on the case of the cost, on the, on, on the grounds of cost. For example, Great Britain's National Health Service denies patients treatments costing more than 35,000 pounds. And this comparative, Center for Comparative Effectiveness is an avenue that could open the door for denying service and care to the American people based upon cost. So that's King 09. King Amendment 10 would repeal Section 211 of the existing Public Law 11-3. That's the S-CHIP expansion bill, but the piece of it which watered down the citizenship requirements that sets us up today so that under, under S-CHIP we do have funding for illegals in this country. And that is a profound, and I'll say a profound disagreement in what the rule of law means in America. And I have long said that if we are not willing to put people back in the condition they were in before they broke the law, we can't enforce any kind of law at all. We're only just shadow boxing with people rather than doing the right thing. And uh, so we had an effective statute in the old Medicaid language that was changed under the most recent up, well, up modernization of the SGIP expansion that took it from 200% of positive poverty to 300%. I don't touch that. I just go to improve the standards so that we can go back to the citizenship standards that were proved so well. And then King Amendment number 11 would remove Section 501 from the bill, which would establish the individual mandate. It's another great, big, important component of the bill. Simple language, but the requirement that individuals purchase insurance. When we go to the point where the federal government tells the American people that they have to reach into their checkbook or their savings, and if they can't afford it, we'll send them down a refundable tax credit, and they have to buy a product, a product that's approved by the federal government, which is without question in the language of this bill, and eventually a product that's perhaps exclusively provided by the federal government, I believe is unprecedented in the history of America. I believe it's a constitutional violation to impose a mand mandatory purchase of insurance on the American people in the case of individuals. So King number 11 strikes that section. And King number 12, that amendment would remove Section 512 from the bill, which would establish an employer mandate for the provision of health insurance. I spent a lot of my life as an employer. I've been an employee and an employer. I started a construction company, company in 1975, and I've hired people and made payroll, and I provided health insurance and retirement benefits. I remember a meeting that took place in the basement of the Faith Lutheran Church in Odebolt sometime in the early 80s. That's near my hometown. And there, former Congressman Fred Grandy, whom many of you knew, very smart policy man, stood before about 80 people in that church, and he said he was proposing his national health care plan. He said, how many of you in here are employers? Out of 80, I remember counting, there were 12. He said, how many of you provide health insurance for your employees? I looked around, and my hand was the only one up. Now, I'll make a, a point on that is that um, back then, I took care of my employees because it was a matter of, a matter of my commitment to, to, as a responsibility as an employer. But I do not believe 
that is an obligation of the employer, an employer, that competition <laughs> to hire good people and keep good people needs to do that, and they need to have personal responsibility. And I think that's a mandate that should be rejected, requiring employers to buy insurance. That got started in World War II, and it got started because there was a wage and price freeze, and employers could take an advantage by, by effectively giving people raises, a de facto raise, by offering benefits that normally didn't exist in those days, by giving health insurance to their employees to get around the wage and price freeze that existed. That's where the foundation of employer-provided insurance has come from in this country, but it is not a constitutional right, it is not a real moral obligation, but it should be a competition-driven thing, and I think it is, and I think it needs to stay that way, and that's why I have King 12, which is the removal of the employer mandate. And the final amendment, which I'm certain that you're all anxious to finally hear the end of my, uh, my description. But remember, this is probably my only chance to debate this bill, my only chance to go on the record. And uh, there are a lot of us that are very frustrated. King number 13, this amendment would remove Section 213 from the bill, which would require insurance companies to abide by arbitrary government ratings requirements. According to studies done by Insurer Wellmark, this will greatly increase the cost of insurance premiums for many, many Americans. And so that, would, uh, that concludes the list. And uh, I know we're at a historical time in this country. We are at a fork in the road. And maybe, maybe we're at the Rubicon. We really need to think about what we're doing here because if this bill becomes law, We've crossed a line we can't come back from. I think we all know that this legislation is not something that would be repealed by a subsequent Congress because it creates a dependency class of people. And it turns everyone in America into some kind of a dependency class of people. It takes responsibility away from people, and it takes it onto the hands of government. It creates a huge series of 111 bureaucracies. And those bureaucracies will grow, and the administration costs of these 111 bureaucracies that are created by this bill suddenly become, and over time become, a huge burden. A huge burden on the taxpayers, and a huge burden on the private sector, and a huge burden on the American people. And the day will come, mark my words, if this legislation passes, some of us in the room will live to see the day that this Congress is back deliberating on striking the administrative burden of collecting premiums from the American people and simply taxing Americans and giving them free health care without an accounting of the cost of it because the cost of the accounting is far higher than anything that's been considered in any discussions that I know of at this point. That is one of the things that weighs heavily on me. I will conclude it there in deference to the time that it is in the morning. I appreciate the attention on the part of the members of this committee that have paid attention. And I urge that these amendments be included to, for deliberation and debate in the floor tomorrow. Thank you very much. Any questions of Mr. King? Yes. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And let me just uh, thank my friend, uh, Mr. King, for uh, the dedication that he's shown. I mean, it is the middle of the night, and he is here seizing, uh, as he correctly said at the end, the one opportunity. I mean, we have uh, not a thousand-page bill before us that was considered H.R. 3200, but we have a bill that is more than twice the size of the measure that was um, reported out of the Energy and Commerce Committee and then the other committees that reported uh, this out. So this is the one and only committee that is considering this legislation. And there are modifications that are going to be made to this bill, which will clearly be a contravention of the commitment that was made to allow the American people and the members of this institution to have 72 hours to look at the legislation before it is voted on, based on the track that we're on right now. And the amendments that my friend has offered are very thoughtful, and I hope very much that the committee will make them in order, but I won't be surprised if they don't make them in order. I know my friend feels the same way, but um, the fact is we're doing the best that we can to try and stop something that could be very, very bad and when my friend mentioned this issue of dependence, I'm reminded of um, the amendment that was offered in the Energy and Commerce Committee to repeal Medicare. And uh, it brought to mind uh, the fact that a number of people have looked at that great conservative leader who stood side by side with Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, in Great Britain. And the question was often asked why she didn't take the steps to obliterate 
the NHS in Great Britain. And the fact of the matter is, every single Brit had a vested interest in the NHS. Similarly, every single American has a vested interest in Social Security and Medicare, and these are government programs. And we're now on the precipice of moving towards another program which could be very, very, very devastating to our economy. And I hope very much that we don't do that. And I hope that we do take the very thoughtful proposals that we have, some of which are included in the amendments that you have offered, that will allow us to recognize that um, affordability increases accessibility. If we can bring the cost down, more Americans will have access to quality health insurance, which is what our goal is. So thank my friend for being here. Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Hastings. Mr. McGovern, earlier today, um, I challenged uh, uh, Mr. Uh, McCune, uh, McKean um, uh, regarding uh, the substantive changes from 3200 to 3962. And the argument that I was making is that uh, members of Congress, um, at the very least among um, uh, the American public, really had an opportunity to know those things uh, that are in 3962 uh, from previous experiences. And I said rather passionately that I would prove it. I have that responsibility now to point out uh, that uh, the establishment of a process for the review and public disclosure of health insurance premium increase, increases and justification for those increases by the Secretary of Human Services and states beginning in 2010 and other uh, uh, parts of that are expanded from the original bill. Um, uh, one of the things that happens in 3962 is the repeal of the McCarran-Ferguson Act insurance antitrust exemption with respect to health insurance and medical malpractice insurance. The Judiciary Committee had a hearing on this particular matter. Um, this measure, the new one, directs the uh, uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services, who I'm very pleased um, uh, took of her time uh, to walk many of us um, uh, through this matter, including as late as today, to discuss this matter with us. Um, it, it allows um, uh, uh, that the HHS secretary will work with the states uh, to have an alternative uh, program to state high-risk pools as a part of the new national high-risk pool program for people who can't get health insurance in today's marketplace. Uh, the President of the United States um, had those remarks in his speech. There are a variety of technical changes that took place in 3962. I won't go into them. One of the others, and I still say that it's de minimis, and at least members here knew or should have known, either from the Ways and Means Committee, from the, um, uh, the Energy and Commerce Committee, um, several of them are that are, are changes have, have been substantive parts of the legislative process. Uh, this one makes clarifications uh, to the interstate insurance compacts that require the Secretary of HHS to develop model guidelines for compacting states, and it ensures that the interstate insurance compacts do not override state laws governing rate review and fraud, and makes clear that the compacting states determine which of the compacting states' laws serve as primary for the insurance company. That came from our colleagues distinguished uh, and um, uh, very uh, uh, on point uh, from our uh, colleagues, our Republican colleagues in the minority. Ms. King, let me turn to you. Of the 13 amendments that you offer, how many of them are in the Republican substitute? Mr. Hastings, I don't know that I can answer that question. I've not signed on to the Republican substitute. I've not refused to. I've not evaluated it. I have an agenda that I come here with the franchise of my So arguably none of them, or you did not seek yourself or to go or to your leadership or others in the committees of jurisdiction and ask of them or to or, or take this. These, uh, these issues are issues that have been raised uh, for some time. Yeah, absolutely. I have other issues that I would have liked to have offered for amendments. I have pared this down, but I think we know what the vehicle is. Right. I, um, 
I guess sometimes I don't have a life because I watch you on C-SPAN uh, at night you don't. a lot. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm grateful uh, that uh, C-SPAN has stood the test of time here with us this evening, and my colleagues will tire of me. Uh, but I want to point out uh, yet something else. Maybe not you. Do you know where the Office of Legislative Counsel is at, at, here at the Capitol? I don't believe I've walked into the Office of Legislative Counsel. My and staff will do those communications. have a significant number of other members here who don't even know, number one, where it is. The point that I wish to make is we call ourselves um, uh, people trying to save money. And I perceive you, and uh, I respect it immensely. Uh, many of my colleagues, uh, you and Democrats, perceive yourselves as fiscal conservatives. And yet, uh, now that you have this prerogative, and I would fight to the death for you to have this prerogative. But one of the things that some of the people here don't understand is the irresponsibility, in my view, of um, uh, abusing the process here. If 435 members or, and five, six delegates had sought 13 amendments, or eight as Dr. Burgess had, seven as uh, others had, which is your right. A uh, uh, footnote there, Jeff Flake came here and had trouble at Legislative Council getting many of his um, uh, measures opposed to earmarks um, recorded for uh, uh, the record. So he had his own office to do a significant number of them and brought them here, as is e each of our prerogatives. If we were to burden our staffs with what we burden legislative council with, uh, I, 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 I dare say we wouldn't be able to keep uh, very uh, many people here. Some people in this body don't have any appreciation at all uh, for the burden on legislative uh, uh, council and the process. These extraordinary people that work here on into the night and the morning recording what we uh, uh, have put here. The financial costs are enormous, and yet a lot of members don't want to provide adequate space. I fought that issue on behalf of legislative council. Remember, I want to move you to the floor of the full house. I yeah. use the resolution. Yeah. No one has more respect for the Rules Committee than me. Yeah, I understand that. And at the same time, I'm telling you that there are people here who don't want to expand the number of persons that work at legislative council, these people work countless hours that most members don't have a clue about what it is that they do and how they do it. All I'm saying, and perhaps there should be a tutorial here, uh, that members need to understand how not to burden of uh, uh, this process and how to be clean and mean. And if you want to do a hundred amendments, uh, as Jeff did, as was his right, then do them in your own office. And don't, oh, yeah. because there are other things. This is not, health care isn't going to be uh, the uh, universal uh, saving of America. Uh, this is just a step in a process. And there are other things that need to be done, measures that many of us can't get the Legislative Council to handle the empiricism um, uh, 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 simply because we're dealing with people coming in there, one, 15 amendments, Democrats and Republicans, some yeah, Democrats yeah, especially. Yeah. Yes, how are you? I, think my feeling. I just like to say for the record, I was just told by staff that Mr. Flake did do all of his amendments in his office. I said he did. Oh, okay. I'm, That's I, what I said. I said he did. You know what? It's kind of late. You know, yeah. We've only been here for he 12 did. hours. Yeah, yeah, I said that he did, Sorry. and I respect that. And if all of us had Mr. to do Dreyer, the same thing. Longer. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll stop now. I've made my point. There can be fiscal irresponsibility, and I could suggest to you that police officers are out there waiting, other people are waiting uh, to file uh, this particular amendment, and we do this, I guess, because we like to hear our own voices, and I may be standing accused. The gentleman okay. yelled. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just pose this question to the panel. There's a news report today that the chair of this committee had announced that this rules committee was going to only accept two amendments. Now, if that turns out to be true, and uh, I can't quote the news source, um, so I'm pass it out here for what you might have picked up or what you might have heard in this committee. But if that announcement comes out before the Rules Committee meets, then it isn't a matter of wasting paper or the time of the staff personnel. That's a matter of wasting the time of this full committee. 
And I think that's a very important thing to look at, and it should require some real introspection on the part of the majority in this Rules Committee. Well, could it be argued that maybe the chairman of this committee was trying to alert members uh, that there I don't could think be an that abusive up, process? Hastings. I wish I, you had told me. Uh, 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 we'll I see can... how many the Rules Committee adopts, and I, I've, you know, I've had significant frustrations, and I've come here and I've made some, I think, very legitimate arguments, and I've watched some amendments be approved that didn't have nearly as much substance in my view as the ones that I worked very hard on, yeah. and I'd be very happy to draft my amendments in my own shop, but my staff tells me that the Rules Committee may not accept them if they don't have the number that's indexed on them from the office. And so, yeah. if that can be clarified, that might be something well, that could save some time. When you do your next time. 13, I sit on the Rules Committee, and I'll try to do what I can to see to it that they are accepted here. Well, I appreciate your support, Mr. Hastings, and I'd yield back. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much, Mr. King. No one else here to testify. That this closes the hearing portion on H.R. 3962. We will now proceed to consideration of H.R. 3961, the Medicare Physician Payment Reform Act of 2009, is there anybody here wishing to testify on that? Thanks, Steve. Being none, then I think the chair will. So now the, chair, the chair's now receive a motion. So close the hearing. Close the hearing. Uh, this closes the hearing portion of uh, 3961, and the chair will now be in receipt of a motion. Colleagues, ready? Yeah. What is this one? This is Mr. The, uh, Chairman, I move the committee uh, grant HR 3962 the Affordable Health Care for America Act, a structured rule. The rule provides four hours of debate in the House to be equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Energy and Commerce, <coughs> the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Ways and Means and the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Education and Labor. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill, except for clauses 9 and 10 of Rule 21. The rule provides uh, that the amendment printed in Part A of the Rules Committee's report, perfected by the modification printed in Part B of the report, shall be considered as adopted. The rule waives all points of order against provisions of the bill, amended and provides that the bill as amended shall be considered as read. The rule makes in order the further amendment printed in Part C of the Rules Committee report if offered by Representative Stupak of Michigan or his designee, which shall be in order without intervention of any uh, point of order except those arising under Clause 9 of Rule 21, shall be considered as read shall be separately debatable for 20 minutes, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and the proponent, and shall not be subject to a demand for a division of the question. The rule makes in order the further amendment in the nature of a substitute printed in Part D of the report of the Committee on Rules, if offered by Representative Boehner of Ohio or his designee, which shall be in order without intervention of any point of order, shall be considered as read and shall be separately uh, debatable for one hour, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent. The rule provides one motion to recommit, with or without instruction, which shall be considered as read. The rule provides that the, during consideration of an amendment printed in the report of the committee on rules accompanying this resolution, the chair may postpone the question of adoption as though under Clause 8 of Rule 20. The rule also provides uh, for consideration of H.R. 3961, the Medicare Physician Payment Reform Act of 2009, under a closed rule. The rule provides one hour of debate, equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Energy and Commerce. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill except for clauses 9 and 10 of Rule 21 and provides uh, that the bill shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions of the bill. The rule provides one motion to re recommit with or without instruction. Finally, the rule 
provides are that in the engrossment of H.R. 3961, the clerk shall add the text of H.R. 2920 as passed by the House as a new matter at the end of H.R. 3961. Thank you. you. You've heard the uh, uh, motion of the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Hastings. Is there any discussion or amendments? Yes. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me say that um, I'm very sorry that we're here after 1 o'clock in the morning. Um, we have a number of amendments, uh, not surprisingly, uh, that uh, we want this committee to consider. I, uh, I will restate the fact that this has been the only opportunity on a, a bill that is focused on uh, one-sixth of our nation's economy uh, to, for Congress to consider it. And you can talk about all the hearings that have been held on other legislation relating to health care in the past, but no matter how you, you can characterize an additional thousand pages to legislation as de minimis, but the fact of the matter is it is not what was um, promised. And I quoted earlier, and I will again focus on this New Direction for America, the document that Speaker Pelosi uh, offered the American people. And that document, as she was campaigning to win the majority and become Speaker, said that bills should be considered under an open, full, and fair debate consisting of a full amendment process that grants the minority the right to offer its alternatives, plural, grants the minority the right to offer its alternatives, and it goes on to say rules governing floor debate must be reported before 10 p.m. for a bill to be considered the following day. Well, Mr. Chairman, it is uh, after 1 o'clock in the morning, as we all know, we've been here for um, over 11 hours since we began at 2 o'clock uh, this afternoon. And uh, I am very, very concerned about the direction in which we are headed as a committee and as a nation if uh, we're going to uh, have a vote on this on the House floor. And uh, so I uh, would first like to move that the committee postpone a vote on final passage of H.R. 3962 until the promised 72 hours after the rule has been filed so that members have an opportunity to review all of the changes, as de minimis as they might be in the eyes of Mr. Hastings, but all of the changes to the bill and the manager's amendment. Uh, you heard the uh, amendment of the gentleman from California. Um, I would urge a, a no vote. I think this has been a transparent and a deliberative process, and uh, I think we're on the verge of making history here. I think we should move forward, so I'd urge a no vote. All I'm asking for is the 72 hours that were promised. Uh, all those in favor of Mr. Dreyer's amendment say aye. 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 Opposed say no. 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 The chair, the we have a record vote, Mr. Chairman. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. McGovern. No. Mr. Hastings. No. Ms. Matsui. No. Mr. Cardoza. No. Mr. Curie. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Ms. Hendry. Mr. Pollard. No. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. diaz -Gillard. Yes. Mr. Sessions. Aye. Dr. Fox. Aye. Madam Chair. Clerk, report the total. Four The amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I have an amendment to the rule. I move that the committee double the amount of debate time to eight hours. It seems to me that when we've got uh, uh, lots and lots and lots of issues that have come before us and we've seen uh, more questions, I believe, emerge from the hearing that we had today, uh, than we have uh, had answers as it relates to the AARP, as it relates to the issue of economic analysis, which was part of the exchange that Mr. Sessions and Mr. Rangel and other members, the majority had. There are more questions than answers, I believe, that have emerged from the last uh, 11 hours that we've spent together here. And so I think that it would be advisable for us to uh, to have at least eight hours of debate. So I move that we uh, allow for eight hours of debate on Heard this. the gentleman's amendment. All those in, any, any discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 No, no. no. The agenda the knows happen. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. McGovern. No. Mr. Hastings. No. Ms. Matsui. Mr. Cardoza. No. Mr. Akiri. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Sessions. No. Mr. Hendry. Mr. Polis. No. Mr. 
Aye. Mr. Kiesbelar. Yes. Mr. Sessions. Aye. Dr. Fox. Aye. Madam Chair. Clerk report the total. Yeah, amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments? Yes, Mr. Chair. Dreyer. I have an amendment to the rule. Um, I move that the Rules Committee make in order all of the amendments that were submitted to the Rules Committee for consideration 3962. You've heard the uh, amendment of the gentleman. Um, uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 Either chair, the no's have it. A record vote, Mr. Chairman. We'll call the roll. Ms. McGovern. No. Mr. Hastings. No. Ms. Matsui. Mr. Cardoza. No. Mr. Akiri. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Ms. Pindry. Mr. Polis. No. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Diaz Bellar. Yes. Mr. Sessions. Aye. Dr. Fox. Aye. Madam Chair. Clerk report the total. 48 6 days. The amendment is not agreed to, and the 200 and some amendments will not be made in order. Any further amendments? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, right amendment to the rule. I move that the committee make an order and provide the right. necessary waivers for amendment number C. Yes, I'm I know. I, I, just, I was a little slow. That's yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, if that's what happens, I, I know who you are. Uh, okay. That's for sure. Uh, I move the committee make an order and provide the appropriate waivers for uh, the uh, amendment number 67 offered by the ranking member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, Mr. Barton, which would add a group of amendments that were accepted at the Committee on Energy and Commerce's full committee markup but were stripped from H.R. 3962 and were not included in the uh, Dingle Manager's Amendment to H.R. 3962. You've heard the gentleman's amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 No, no. no. Be your chair, the no's have it. Give a record vote, Mr. Clerk Chairman. will call the roll. Mr. McDonald. No. Mr. Hayes. No. Ms. Matsui. Mr. Cardoza. No. Mr. Arcuri. No. Mr. Kormutter. No. Ms. Pindry. Mr. Polis. No. Mr. Dry. Aye. Mr. Diaz Bellard. Yes. Aye. Dr. Fox. Aye. Aye. Clerk report the total. Amendment is, amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Diaz Pilar. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment to the rule. I think the committee make an order to provide the necessary waivers for amendment number 144, offered by Representative Rogers of Michigan, which would strike all the Medicare cuts contained in H.R. 3962. Uh, you have heard the gentleman's uh, amendment. Uh, is there any discussion? Uh, if not, then the vote will occur in the DS bylaw amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 In the chair, the no's have it. Court vote, please. Clerk will call the uh, roll. Mr. McGovern. No. Mr. Hastings. No. Ms. Matsui. <coughs> Mr. Cardoza. No. Mr. Akiri. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Ms. Pingree. Mr. Perlis. No. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Diaz Bellard. Yes. Mr. Sessions. Aye. Dr. Fox. Aye. Madam Chair. Clerk report the total. Four yeas, six nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Diaz Spillard. Another amendment to the rule. I move the committee make an order and provide the necessary waivers for amendment number 142 offered by Representative Barrett of South Carolina, which would strike the section of the bill that eliminates the non taxable reimbursements of over the counter medication from health savings accounts, uh, HSAs, HRAs, and FSAs. You've heard the gentleman's amendment. Did, uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, aye. no. No. Be no. chair, the no's have it. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. McGovern. No. Mr. Hastings. No. Ms. Matsui. Mr. Cardoza. No. Mr. Arcuri. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Ms. Pindry. Mr. Polis. No. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Diaz Bellard. Yes. Mr. Sessions. Aye. Dr. Fox. Aye. Madam Chair. Clerk report the total. Amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Yes, Mr. Diaz Bellard. I have a amendment to the rule and the committee make an order and provide the necessary waivers for amendment number 91 offered by Representative Brady of Texas, which would block the implementation of sections of HR 3962, including reductions to the Medicare program in any geographic area unless the Secretary of HHS certifies that implementation will not result in rationing of health care services, reduced health care services for seniors longer patient wait times, or reduced availability of health care providers participating in the Medicare program. Heard the uh, gentleman's amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those no, no. no. Be a chair, the no's have it. Court of vote. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. McGovern. No. Mr. Hastings. No. Ms. Matsui. Mr. Cardoza. No. Mr. Curie. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Ms. Trindris. Mr. Polis. No. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Yes. Mr. Sessions. Aye. Dr. Fox. Aye. Madam Chair.
clerk report the total. Amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Yes, Mr. Diaz Pilar. I have an amendment to the rule of the committee making order and provide the necessary waivers for number, amendment number 116 offered by Representative Riker of Washington to create a hardship exemption from the employer mandate if its compliance would result in the employer laying off employees, reducing employee wages, or prevent the hiring of new employees. The amendment requires the Secretary of the Treasury to establish documentation to verify such hardship. You heard the gentleman's amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 There's no, no, no. The opinion of the chair, the no's have it. Court of Clerk will call the roll. Mr. McGovern. No. Mr. Hastings. No. Ms. Matsui. Mr. Cardoza. No. Mr. Akiri. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Ms. Pendry. Mr. Polis. No. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. diaz Bellart. Yes. Mr. Sessions. Aye. Dr. Fox. Aye. Madam Chair. Clerk report the total. Four yeas, six nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments. Mr. Sessions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, we've been here uh, almost 12 hours, and uh, it's my chance to go through the bill as we do here in the Rules Committee. And it would have to be an observation that I would make that this uh, this uh, bill that's before us is as much about health care as the stimulus bill was about jobs. That means a lot. Yeah. The stimulus bill. Sure does. We don't even have any idea. Stimulus, the unemployment rate. The yeah. stimulus bill saved a lot of jobs in my district. Yeah, I tell you what. It saved a lot of jobs. It's a way to do it, but we were yeah. told. And where's the unemployment rate? 500, 500, 500 teachers and education support staff in the city of Worcester alone would have been fired. You know, I'm, I'm glad they're still working. You know, what's what's the I know y'all are sensitive about that. Firefighters, we police officers. Would, we were told it would work, and it's well, not well, working. Anyway. But anyway, you remember. And, uh, so I'm going to further predict that this uh, health care reform bill will single-handedly cause a double-dip recession in our economy. Uh, what will occur on the gentleman's prediction? Yeah, well, Is the, that last the, amendment? One, the last one okay. I was right on to. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, I have an amendment to the rule. I move that the committee make an order and provide the necessary waivers for amendment number one, offered by Representative Fleming. Louisiana, Wilson of South Carolina, Gingrey of Georgia, Herger of California, Scalise of Louisiana, which would automatically enroll all members of Congress and all senators in the public option. Uh, vote will occur on the Sessions Amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those no, no. Aye. The opinion of the chair, the no's have it. Mr. Chairman, ask for a quote vote, please. Mr. McGovern. No. Mr. Hastings. No. Ms. Matsui. Mr. Cardozo. No. Mr. Akiri. Mr. Akiri. Mr. Promoter, no. Ms. Pendry, Mr. Polis, no. Mr. Dreyer, aye. Mr. Diaz-Villard, yes. Mr. Sessions, Dr. Fox, aye. Madam Chair. Uh, the clerk will uh, report the total. Yes, amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Mr. Sessions. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I have a minute the rule. I move the committee to make an order and provide the necessary waivers for amendment number 34, offered by Representative Hastings of Washington, which would strike. Section 1156 of the bill, which prohibits the expansion of physician-owned hospitals. Uh, you heard the uh, member of the gentleman from Texas. All those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. aye. Opposed, aye. no. No. Mr. Uh, Ambassador. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. McGovern. No. Mr. Hastings. No. Ms. Natsui. Mr. Cardoza. No. Mr. Arcuri. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Ms. Pendry. Mr. Polis. No. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Diaz-Villard. Yes. Mr. Sessions. Aye. Dr. Fox. Aye. Madam Chair. The clerk report the total. Four yeses. Amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Mr. Sessions of Texas. Mr. Chairman, I have a amendment to the rule. I move the committee back in order to provide the necessary waivers for amendment number 115 offered by Representative Price of Georgia, which would strike section 2401 and insert language establishing best practice guidelines. It places limitations on non-economic damages and punitive damages in a health care lawsuit in cases in which treatment are based upon these practices. For the gentleman's amendment, all in favor of the session's amendment say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. Can you the chair the no's have it? Mr. Chairman, uh, record a vote, please. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. McGovern. No. Mr. Hastings. No. Ms. Matsui. No. Mr. Cardoza. No. Mr. Akiri. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Ms. Pingree. Mr. Polis. No. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Diaz-Villard. Yes. Mr. Sessions. Aye. Dr. Fox. Aye. <coughs> oh, report the total. Four yeas, six nays. 
It is not agreed to. Are there further amendments, Mr. Sessions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I have amendments to rule. I move the committee to make an order to provide the necessary waivers for amendment number 190 offered by myself, which would not allow any of the provisions of this bill to be implemented if the OMB, in consultation with the Department of Labor, would find that 4 million jobs or more would be lost as a result of this bill. For the gentleman's amendment, all those in favor of the session's amendment say aye. Aye. All those opposed to the session's amendment say no. No. We need the chair of the nose have it. Chairman, ask for a report of a place. Who call the roll? Mr. McGovern. No. Mr. Hastings. No. Ms. Matsui. Mr. Cardoza. No. Mr. Akiri. No. Mr. Kilmutter. No. Ms. Kendry. Mr. Polis. No. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Yes. Mr. Session. Aye. 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 Clerk, report the total. Four yeas, six nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments, Mr. Sessions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee to make an order to provide the appropriate waivers for an amendment that would prohibit the criminal penalties that provide a $25,000 fine and up to a year in prison and up to a $250,000 fine and up to five years in prison for non-compliance and the individual mandate uh, if offered by myself or my designate. Heard the gentleman's amendment. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. Opinion no. of the chair, the noes have it. Mr. Chairman, ask for a report of a Clerk will call the roll. Mr. McGovern. No. Mr. Hastings. No. Ms. Matsui. Mr. Cardoza. No. Mr. Akira. No. Mr. Kromut. No. Ms. Kendry. Mr. Polis. No. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Diaz Ballard. Yes. Mr. Sessions. Aye. Dr. Fox. Aye. Madam Chair. Clerk report the total. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there are further amendments. Mr. Sessions. Ooh. Dr. Fox. Well, I, I do have some amendments. Before I offer them, I, I want to say I agree with my colleagues that this has been a very uh, negative process that we've gone through on this bill and that the results of this bill, I think, are going to be jobs are going to be destroyed, seniors are going to be denied services because of the cuts in Medicare, debt on our children is going to, con going to go up tremendously, health care costs are going to go up, taxes are going to go up, and it's going to be a very negative effect on our society. There, Republicans agree that we need to do something to reform health care, but this is not the way to do it. We've offered some very sensible ways to do it. They've all been rebuffed. I think that we will see what we've seen with the bailout and the stimulus, that they're all going to work backwards. This is going to work backwards from the way people thought it was going to work. And I think all the broken promises we've had from the speaker and the president are good indications of what's going to happen as a result of this bill. Now, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to offer my amendments. Thank you. I have an amendment to the rule. I move that the committee make an order and provide the necessary waivers for amendment number 203 offered by Representative Fox of North Carolina, which would direct the Secretary of Health and Human Services to extend for two years the reclassification in effect during fiscal year 2009 for hospitals whose Medicare Geographic Classification Review Board reclassification changed from fiscal year 2009 to fiscal year 2010 or ended as of September 30, 2009, the affected hospitals would have 20 days from enactment and publication of this provision to notify the Secretary of their decision to extend their fiscal 2009 reclassification. This is a temporary extension. Any Medicare Geographic Classification Review Board reclassification that these hospitals have or will obtain for fiscal years beyond the two-year extension will remain valid. You've heard the uh, amendment by the uh, general lady for North Carolina. Are there, um, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 The opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Do we have a recorded vote? Clerk will Jim. call the roll. Mr. McGovern. No. Mr. Hastings. No. Ms. Matsui. Mr. Cardoza. No. Mr. Arcuri. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Ms. Kendry. Mr. Polis. No. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Diaz Ballard. Yes. Mr. Sessions. Aye. Dr. Fox. Aye. Madam Chair. Clerk will call the uh, total. Yeah. 
The amendment is not agreed to. The further amendments, Dr. Fox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment to the rule. I move that the committee make an order and provide the necessary waivers for the following amendments to be considered and separately debated for 10 minutes. Amendment number 56, offered by Representatives Deal of Georgia, Heller of Nevada, Wilson of South Carolina, and Sam Johnson of Texas, which would limit participation in the taxpayer-funded exchange to U.S. citizens and members of one of the nine groups of qualified aliens that are eligible for Medicaid. To enforce this requirement, the Commissioner must verify that all applicants who purchase an exchange participating plan are qualified based on citizenship or qualified alien status, and it requires the Commissioner to verify the identity of all applicants using the same process used in Medicaid. Amendment number 60, offered by Representatives Deal of Georgia, Heller of Nevada, Wilson of South Carolina, and Sam Johnson of Texas, which would require the Health Choices Commissioner to verify that all applicants for affordability credits are U.S. citizens or members of one of the nine groups of qualified aliens that are eligible for Medicaid and requires the Commissioner to verify the applicant's identity using the same identity verification process the DRA required for Medicaid applicants. And amendment number 130 offered by Representative King of Iowa, which would require that beneficiaries of the insurance exchange provide proof of their citizenship. Uh, Mr. Polis? Yeah. Yeah, I'd just like to briefly address the uh, King amendment that this uh, amendment makes in order, as well as the Dean Heller number 56. Uh, both of those, I'd like to uh, remind my colleagues, are violations of PAYGO. Uh, would, would force taxpayers to subsidize illegal aliens to the tune of tens of billions of dollars if they were prevented from buying insurance on their own. Uh, and I would, I would note that those amendments are not paid for with tax increases, which uh, I made clear to Mr. McKean, which had a similar amendment Mr. Deal had already left, that he would have to include in there if he didn't want to incur deficit spending. I would encourage my colleagues not to allow those amendments to go back. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Diaz-Balart. If uh, these amendments uh, were made in order by the committee, I would vote against them on the floor. Uh, I think that uh, due to the very, very uh, really critical nature of the issue that we've been discussing for 12 hours, this legislation, uh, that all ideas by colleagues in the form of amendments uh, should be able to have an airing. Uh, should be able to be considered, uh, even amendments uh, with which, as, an in, as in this instance, uh, I disagree. So I will be voting for the possibility of floor uh, discussing Thank the amendments, uh, though I would, if the committee makes them in order, uh, I would vote against them on the floor. Thank you very much. Um, the vote now occurs on the uh, Fox Amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 Can you the chair? The noes have it. Do we have a recorded vote, Mr. Chairman? Clerk will call the roll. <laughs> Mr. McGovern. No. Mr. Hastings. No. Ms. Matsui. Mr. Cardoso. No. Mr. Akiri. No. Mr. Pillmother. No. Ms. Kendrick. Mr. Polis. No. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Yes. Mr. Sessions. Aye. Dr. Fox. Aye. Dr. Chair. Clerk will report the total. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments? Dr. Fox. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment to the rule. I move that the committee make an order and provide the necessary waivers for amendment number 114 offered by Representative Price of Georgia, which would add language protecting the private right to contract between individuals and health care providers. You heard the amendment of the general lady. Any uh, uh, discussion? If not, the vote occurs on the Fox Amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those, no, no. no. Can you chair the nose have it? Could we have a recorded vote, Mr. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. McGovern. No. Mr. Hastings. No. Ms. Matsui. Mr. Cardoza. No. Mr. Arcuri. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Ms. Kingry. Mr. Polis. No. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Diaz-Balart. Yes. Mr. Sessions. Aye. Dr. Fox. Aye. Madam Chair. Uh, clerk will uh, report the total. 386 minutes. Madam does not agree to the further amendments. Dr. Fox. What are you looking Fox, for? You, the last, last one. one. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment to the rule. I move that the committee make an order and provide the necessary waivers for amendment number 35 offered by Representatives Paulson of Minnesota, 
Gerlock of Pennsylvania, and Lance of New Jersey, which would remove the medical innovation tax and replace it with unobligated stimulus funds. For the uh, general ladies amendment, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 Repeat the chair, the noes have it. Did we have a recorded vote, Mr. Chairman? Clerk will call the roll. Mr. McCullough. No. Mr. Hastings. No. Ms. Matsui. Mr. Cardoza. Yes. No. Mr. Curry. No. Mr. Schilmeyer. No. Mr. Kendrick. Mr. Pollard. No. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Yes. Mr. Sessions. Aye. Dr. Fox. Aye. Madam Chair. Clerk, report the total. Boyer, Amendment is not agreed to. Any further amendments? Mr. Chair, uh, before we uh, proceed with the, uh, the vote on final passage, we've been here 11 and one half hours mm -hmm. now since we, uh, since we convened, and I'd like to, we are scheduled to convene in just a few hours on the House floor. I suspect we're moving ahead. I wondered if, if the chair might give us some indication as to what we might expect as far as the schedule is concerned. My, 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 ten minutes is, uh, yeah. minutes. It, on, on this measure? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, I mean, it's this, but I'm told the schedule has already been published, that we're going to come in at nine o'clock. There are going to be ten minutes, ten, one minutes each side. Mm -hmm. And uh, so votes, so votes and suspensions, then the rule, and then if the rule passes, we proceed with the bill. I see. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. No further amendments. Uh, before we vo vote on this, I want to I want to thank everybody for um, their participation in this long committee, the staff in particular, the uh, committee reporter, um, and um, absolutely, and we appreciate uh, all your work and. Uh, And I, I, you know, since I, I get, since I'm acting chair here, I get, I get to close this, um, and I want to close it on a, on a positive note. Um, we've heard all the, the negatives about, the, about what the potential of this bill. I think there's a lot more to be said about the positives. We got 40 million Americans without health insurance. You know, this is the opportunity to get, if not all of them, most of them insured. We have fraud, waste, and abuse, and a lot of government programs that people complain about all the time. This is a bill that will clean that up. We have small business that, that businesses that can't afford the, the, the cost of health insurance. We're trying to control costs so the small businesses and families can, uh, can afford the health care uh, that they want. We, we want to emphasize prevention. Um, there's so much in this that is good. We've come so close to this point so many times in our history during the, the, during the last 100 years, and we've always lost at the end because of special interests that have come up you know, and tried to kill this bill. I think tomorrow, uh, those who don't vote with us, I think are on the wrong side of history. And I believe this is the right thing to do. Is with that. Mr. Chairman, I, if, I, if I might, uh, if you would yield, uh, to simply say that as you've outlined your goals, with our substitute, we share every single one of the goals that you have said. And we believe that we will be able, in a more cost-effective way, without government involvement, achieve exactly what you said. And job and potential job loss achieve exactly what you have said uh, we can achieve. Well, and I appreciate that, and I would again not to carry on this debate, but you had your chance, um, and uh, we ended up with more and more people uh, joining the roles of the uninsured. We need to go in a different direction now. With that, I ask uh, uh, for the uh, vote on the uh, motion of the gentleman from Florida, uh, Mr. Hastings. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed. No. Aye. I ask for a recorded vote. Mr. McCover. Aye. Mr. Hastings. Mr. Chairman, I want my legacy to be that I voted for health care. Thank you. Ms. Matsui. Mr. Cardoza. Aye. Mr. Curry. Yes. Mr. Perlmutter. Aye. Ms. Pendry. Mr. Polis. Aye. Mr. Dreyer. No. Mr. Diaz-Gillard. No. Mr. Sessions. No. Dr. Fox. No. Adam Curry. Clerk will report the total. The, the motion is agreed to, and uh, the chairman slaughter will uh, handle this for the majority. And for the Republicans, a gentleman from the Big D, Mr. Sessions, will be managing. Thank you. The Rules Committee stands adjourned.
The House Rules Committee began their work Friday afternoon at 2 Eastern Time and just past 1.30 a.m. on Saturday. The Rules Committee has set the debate per, uh, parameters for Saturday's debate on the House health care bill. The House is scheduled to meet at 9 a.m. Eastern today. Members must uh, first approve the debate rules set by the House uh, Rules Committee tonight. If that passes, the measure can move on to uh, formal debate in the House. The Associated Press reported earlier that House Democratic leaders today were still trying to line up the final votes needed to pass health care legislation. Democratic leader Steny Hoyer says they're very close, but he also says the vote scheduled for Saturday could slip by a day or two. Republican leaders say all 177 House Republicans stand ready to oppose the health care bill. Several Democrats have already announced their opposition as well, most of them moderate to conservative members of the Blue Dog Coalition. Democrats hold 258 seats in the House and can afford 40 defections and still wind up with 218, a majority if all lawmakers vote. 